I'm going to join and then I'm going to hit top. Special section E pass resolution hearing. Good evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our impasse meeting tonight. I now call to order the special session impasse resolution hearing of the Board of Commissions of the City of Tarpa Springs on Monday, October 12, 2020, at 6.30 p.m. Ms. Manusas, roll call, please. Mayor, you have an item before you with the excusal of Commissioner Terpani. You mute. Um. No, we can hear you. Before I take roll, we have an item for the excusal request from Commissioner Tayer Panning for today's meeting and tomorrow's meeting. Um, Deputy Clerk, let's, I think the mayor's having some issues with his speakers. Let's give him a second, see if he can figure it out. <laughs> mayor, can you hear us, Mayor? 
I should be able to say something, will you? Yeah, can, can you hear us? I'm not sure if your speakers are up or not. I, yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, great. Ms. Manus, is roll call, please. Okay, Mayor, before I call roll, we have an item for the excusal of Commissioner Terrapani from tonight's meeting and also tomorrow night's meeting. Yeah, we'll do that afterwards, after the uh, roll call, please. Well, I won't know if Commissioner Terrapani is excused or not. Okay, good point. Well, we need a motion to excuse Commissioner Terrapani from tonight's meeting and tomorrow night's regular session due to the family matters. So I need a motion. Motion to excuse. Second. And roll call. Commissioner Batagiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Alhuzas? Yes. I'll go ahead and call roll now. Mayor Alahuzis? Here. Vice Mayor Carr? Here. Commissioner Terrapani is absent and excused. Commissioner Donovan? Here. Commissioner Vatagiotis? Here. We are now going to the uh, public comments. Uh, please state your name, your address for the record. If you have any comments, it will be given four minutes. We do have a raised hand, Mr. Mayor. I'll allow them in. If you please state your name and address for the record. Uh, yes, my name is Chrissy Kladakis, 301 Banana Street. Go ahead, Ms. Kladakis. Good evening, Mayor Alhuzos. Um, I would like to thank you and all the other commissioners and chief coaching for their time and dedication to our city and for tirelessly working for us during these unprecedented times. COVID has been an industry changer, a life changer, a city changer, and an essential worker changer. I am an essential worker who knows firsthand the dangers and added precautions I've had to take with working with the general public and of the potential risks of bringing COVID home to my loved ones. I have had to constantly be washing my hands, hand sanitizing, changing gloves, masks, wearing protective eye eyewear from droplets, wiping down all personal items and leaving my uniforms and shoes out of the house. It was exhausting mentally and physically and an added stress in my life. So when I was given the option to take a leave as a flight attendant, I volunteered. But not all essential workers have the opportunity to take a leave to protect themselves and their families because of an oath they took to serve and protect. They are our first responders. I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of the Tarpon Springs Police Department and what I've witnessed in my short five months back in Tarpon Springs. I recently purchased a beautiful 1929 home two blocks from where I grew up, which is in the historic district near downtown and only two blocks away from Craig Park, where we have our epiphany cross diving. I have fond memories here, but fast forward to the last five months and it's a stark difference. The Shepherd Center is at the end of my street, Boyer and Ultra 19, and yes, I understand it's a major artery through our town, but what I didn't know until I moved here was that it is the largest food bank in Pinellas County. I know this because one day there were so many cars lined up down Boyer that it wrapped all around my house onto Banana Street and it lasted for two months. I walked to the end of the street, spoke to the woman in charge, and she explained to me that it was a Feed America food drive in addition to the normal recipients the Shepherd Center serves. She also pointed out that they just recently built showers on the north end of the building where I witnessed the Tarpon Springs Police Department keeping the peace because it becomes a food frenzy. And on the south end, they give out hot meals to in to go containers. The problem is they don't leave and they don't obey the law. They actually create more work for our police department. I've had conversations with my neighbors where they have informed me that the volume of people going to this facility has exponentially increased since COVID. I've talked to other neighbors that have confirmed the increase in numbers and I've seen the volume firsthand. I found someone sitting on my porch one day and when I asked her to leave, she wouldn't. And when I told her I was going to call the police, she told me to call. I don't feel comfortable leaving my cushions on my porch because they will go missing as my other items have. On another occasion, I was outside in my yard and saw about four or five officers rush by with lights flashing to the bayou for a definite emergency, where I later found out that it was for a shooting they had at 5.30 in the afternoon at Craig Park. Another day, I got a shipment of Nike sneakers. I didn't know who the recipient was, but it was my address. Later that afternoon, a young man walks up to my house and says they were his packages and that he lives on Lime Street, but pointed towards Lemon Street. I gave him the boxes because he identified the name on the box, but the next day, the FedEx driver came with two more Nike boxes. I looked at the name and said, this isn't me. He graduated with my sister, so he knows my last name, but he said it could be a scam. 
A few minutes later, the same young man pulls up and wanted his boxes. I let the FedEx driver deal with him, and I was told later it was a scam. My family owns the bridge lounge, and one day I noticed there was a man in a hospital gown with a wristband sitting outside on one of the tables during COVID-19 phase one. We were close, so when I asked him to leave, he refused to leave, so I called the Tarpon Springs Police Department. When I asked them how the patient got so far down Alder 19 in a gown and socks, they informed me that the hospital puts them on a bus. He must have been dropped off at the bus stop near the sponge docks. I'm not sure, but I'm sure they have the same problem. I read about the commissioner's decision to remove the benches in front of the library to curb the homeless situation. And then one day I happened to be in Wells Fargo with my mother and there was a transient homeless man yelling at the tape teller next to us for not cashing his check for the second week in a row because he couldn't provide identification that matched the check. I was definitely concerned for my safety and for that of my mother's because of his erratic behavior. He left and the employees informed me that it has gotten worse in there since uh, y'all cut the city benches out. For those reasons, I made my way to Britain's and purchased my second handgun because I'm not going, I'm going about my daily life in Tarp and I've had this many incidents happen to me in five months. I can't even imagine the overload of work the Tarpon Springs Police Department has had to face in light of COVID and that they might actually might be outnumbered. Not only do they have the stress of wearing extra protective equipment to protect themselves and their loved ones from COVID, but they're dealing with a huge increase of issues due to this pandemic. Suicide is up, homelessness is up, domestic violence is up, drug and alcohol abuse is up, food banks are running out of food. This list is not exhaustive, I'm sure. National defunding of the police is on the news. Police officers are getting harassed at home. They have to be exhausted, underpaid. Mayor, and I, I'm sorry? Ms. Kuliakis, I think the mayor is trying to um, stop you because your time's up. Um, okay, can I just finish my last sentence? I, I just have Mayor, one more little you're paragraph. On, you're on mute, Chris. Oh. Ms. Kledakis, go ahead and finish up if you only have just a little bit. Okay, I just have one more paragraph, Mayor. Thank you. I just said, so this is one. We have a, a police department We it defines us as a city because we have our own police department. It sets us apart on like un, unincorporated areas. I attended last week's Zoom call, which consisted of over four hours of discussions regarding art sculptures, light fixture design, railroad crossing aesthetics, flower planters, parking for downtown, and how to view Fire City. With all due respect to our commissioners and for their time spent on these issues, I don't feel those things are the best use of our taxpaying dollars at this moment. I would much rather see those dollars go to funding our Tarpon Springs Police Department to help them in whatever way they need. If my facts are correct, we haven't hired a new patrol officer since Mr. the untimely Mrs. Kladakis, uh, your time has expired. We have okay, to Okay, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Manuzas, have we received any emails? Uh, we have. Are there any other public comments waiting to we, be heard? We do have another raised hand. Uh, Mrs. Manuzas, let me correct you. We're first going to the uh, uh, receive emails, and then we're doing that. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have about five emails received. I'll go with the first one. First email was received from Bernadette Taylor to the Honorable Mayor, Board of Commissioners, and the city citizens of Tarpon Springs, Florida. Re SC PBA impasse resolution. My name is Bernadette Taylor, and I live at 383 Dixie Highway, Tarpon Springs, Florida, 34689. I am writing to formally have my comments entered into the official board meeting minutes regarding the matter of the impasse resolution and the TARP TSPD on pay increase negotiations. To preface, my family and I have lived here since 2010. Tarpon Springs is a vibrant community that because of our professional and highly responsive Tarpon Springs Police Department, I consider to be the safest city I have ever lived in. Since moving here, we have seen the life of one of our own police department family members extinguished by, the, by a murder. Most recent, our town experienced a drive-by shooting where the alleged shooter was exponentially arrested. But aside from these incidences, our department handles any issues perfectly and professionally. Now that their contract has expired, I would like to make a plea for the TSPD and grant them what they want in their new contract. They're asking for a 3% pay increase which is very reasonable and seems to be somewhat in line with other departments throughout the state. What I find completely unfair is the most departments get a guaranteed minimum of 2% per year. Most of these police departments also get paid for shift differential as well as longevity pay. A 3% increase is not the highest either, but very, very reasonable. 
TSPD is worth it. With the current social political climate of defunding the police, we need to fairly compensate our men and women in blue. Most Americans on social security receive a yearly cost of living adjustment of about two to 3%. And that is while not working. Without children to support, with no risk to the physical body, and most are already at or above retirement age. Most of our officers have families that depend on them. It is sad that our police officer depends on overtime just to make ends meet, and most spouses of officers must work to survive and keep their families afloat. Over the past few years, we have seen a population boom in Tarpon, and with more residents and more new homes, which then increases the amount of taxes the city receives, but in turn increases the workload on the department. With this, the city should have no problem paying our officers what they want. In fact, should pay them more, especially longevity pay to keep our good officers from leaving for other departments, even the private sector. This is a positive effect that is threefold. First, it encourages officers to spend more years on the same force. Thus, turnover is low and you don't have to spend more time and more training new officers, more money training new officers. Second, keeping officers for long periods of time has been proven to show a greater camaraderie between the officers and those they serve, fostering positive community policing relationships. Third, it keeps our officers happy. In such an emotionally driven job that often goes unappreciated, paying them more only yields motivated and happy employees. Most departments and even private sector jobs, for the matter, offered shift differential pay, which is another way of promoting positivity in the department. I came from a small town that bordered the highest crime rate city, Camden, New Jersey, and know every single police officer by first name and never felt safer. With so many people that have such disdain for police officers right now, don't you think giving our officers these small incentives and a decent pay would make up for how much more they have to deal with, especially with how much greater their overall sacrifice really is? Putting their lives on the line for complete strangers. It should be criminal. It should be criminal that until recently you made it unnecessarily impossible for the spouses of fallen officers to get the death benefit that is owed them. And the fact that if they happen to get injured at work, that they would have would only receive 75% of their pay. That's criminal. The fact that an impasse even occurred leaves me with the thought that maybe we, the residents, need some fresh blood in office. The city is more concerned with purchasing signs for the gate at Sunset Beach and other locations, as well as trying to acquire more properties than it is paying for the protection of its citizens. Who do you think is going to keep lawbreakers from ripping those signs down? Our police. So please make a change and give our officers a decent raise over the next few years. Offer them shift deferential and law longevity pay that they deserve and like many, many other departments offer. If not, then expect changes to happen within our city government decision makers. One would think that the city manager would remember what life was like when he was an officer, where he started. Thank you for your time and consideration. Mayor, we have another one from, Diane, from Diane Griffin. Our wonderful police department Tarpon Springs deserves, deserves their raise. Please find the, mon the money somewhere. They risk their lives every day to make Tarpon great. The least we can do for them, for, for our wonderful police force, is give them the raise they deserve and we're supposed to get already. It's terrible that they are expected to protect and serve and they do not get their raise on time. Sincerely, Diane Griffin. Another email, Randy Hennessy, board members. I find a large problem that the city has money to buy a 650,000 piece of property that you have no plans for, but will not offer our police department a 3% raise. The police department raise should be approved without hesitation, thanks. From Elizabeth Markowitz, dear commissioner, I respectfully request that raises for TS police be approved. If funding is an issue, I support the police raise over expenditure for properties or land. And the last one from Carmen 
Piscatelli. Hello, I found this issue on a local feed on Facebook. Having just moved here from out of state, we are still familiarizing ourselves with local sites and local issues. I am a retired law enforcement officer from California. My career consisted of 20 years with the San Diego County Sheriff's Department as a deputy slash detective and another three years with the San Diego District Attorney's Office as an investigator. I am now a realtor in the process of licensing in Florida. My husband is a Vietnam veteran and also in the real estate business. We moved to this area because of the cost of living and it is safe, quiet place to retire to. I think some of that has to be because of the quality of officers with the Tarpon Springs PD. I just found out that the commissioners voted down a 3% raise for the fine officers of Tarpon Springs. I am appalled and that it was voted this way and strongly feel that a wrong decision was made by most commissioners. I can only assume that none of you have seen evil or crime up close or have experienced fear. Let me tell you, I have, and it exists. Police around the world have the same experiences and that is why there is a thin blue line. That thin blue line is the only thing between peace and violence rioting, mayhem, good and evil. I am confident that you, that you severely underestimate police officers' value. And along with any industry slash company, there are bad apples among many good apples. Police need our support more than ever now. Please do not taint my feelings about Tarpon Springs with an underpaid, demoralized, undervalued police department. After all, Tarpon Springs is my new hometown forever. Mayor, that is the la that was the last email. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Jeff. Do we have anybody else that is wishing to speak? Yes, sir. We do have a raised hand at this time. Please connect him. If you could please state your name and address for the record. Hi, Teresa Kondak, and my address would be listed for tonight, 444 Huey Avenue, Tarpon Springs. Um, for those I haven't met yet, um, I'm the widow of Officer Kondak, who was killed in the line of duty in 2014, protecting the citizens of Tarpon Springs. The Tarpon Springs officers mean a great deal to me, which is why I'm here to voice my concern for the city manager's recent denial for a standard wage increase of 3%. Comparing the city's current budget, population, and wages with other local police agencies, these officers are below the pay scale and lack other standard benefits as well. It's my understanding that COVID has not been a confirmed reason for denying them the standard 3% request. And as of today, the police department has not been defunded. Since these funds for the 3% raise would be used from property taxes collected. I'm not understanding the justification for spending thousands of dollars for more city property or anything else in, more important than funding those protecting the city. Not approving their very basic 3% increase for those still willing to risk their lives protecting the city of Tarpon Springs not only doesn't make financial sense, but it would be shameful, especially after proposing a 3% raise for the city manager himself along with other city employees. And your city manager of all people should understand the overwhelming stress, danger, and pressure these officers face every day since he previously served as police chief himself. I find it disheartening that this impasse is, is even necessary. So I ask tonight that you, the city commissioners, consider this very standard request to hopefully retain and support the officers that are still serving the city that gave their vote for your seats. I'm hopeful you'll make the right decision just as you have for my family in the past regarding the death benefit for these dedicated officers. They do so much that goes unprotected and unnoticed, I'm sorry, but this absolutely shouldn't be unnoticed. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Jump, anybody else? At this time, we do not have any other raised hands, sir. Thank you. I am now turning the meeting over to the city attorney, Mr. Andrew Filter, to make a brief introduction and comments. Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Vice Mayor, Commissioners, um, want to go over briefly with the commissioners this process because it's not a, a, a usual process that you all are, are used to. Uh, as you know, with uh, having a, a union, 
from time to time, the city's administration uh, will undertake negotiations with the union. Uh, if those negotiations fail, then the sides may declare what is called an impasse. If they declare an impasse, then under the statutes, both the um, chief executive and the union are to pass on to the legislative body, that being you, their, their uh, respective proposals for how they see the impasse to be resolved. Uh, the legislature, the, the statute says that the legislature, legislative body shall forthwith conduct a public hearing. Excuse me, Mr. Mr. Eschfelter, would you please repeat what you say because we're, you cut off? Sure. Can you hear me? We can hear you now, yes. Okay. So the, the statute says that after the, the respective positions of the parties are passed on to your board, that, that the legislative body shall forthwith conduct a public hearing at which the parties shall be required to explain their positions. That's what we're doing tonight. Thereafter, the legislative body shall take such action as it deems to be in the public interest, including the interest of the public employees involved to resolve all of the disputed impasse issues. So now I wanna talk briefly with the commission about what its role is tonight. Because the ultimate authority to resolve disputed impasse issues rests with the legislative body, where the legislative body of the public employer is the same, as is the case here, the public employer would enjoy a substantial advantage over employees and their union if there were not checks on its exercise of its impasse resolution authority, since public employees in Florida are prohibited from striking. Therefore, the law requires that the legislative body render its decision on impasse issues in a public hearing and only after the parties, including the union's representative, have been afforded the opportunity to explain their position on the disputed issues to the legislative body. The law also requires that the legislative body consider the public interest which includes the interest of the public employees in resolving each impasse issue. The state's Public Employee Re uh, Re Relations Commission has construed these statutory limitations as placing upon a legislative body the exercise of its impasse resolution authority, a strict duty of fairness and impartiality, not unlike that which governs quasi-judicial procedures, which you all are more familiar with. Chapter 447 of the Florida Statutes therefore contemplates that as the collective bargaining process moves to impasse, the status of the legislative body converts from one of a disputant in the process to a representative of the entire general public, representing the public in the dispute requires that the public employer legislative body consider equally the positions of the parties in order to arrive at a fair and impartial decision. As a matter of policy, the legislative body bears a special responsibility during the final stage of impasse because of the absence of meaningful alternatives. As a result of the strike prohibition in the absence of a binding interest arbitration, the only alternative available for a union is to advance its position following impasse to this body. It is incumbent upon the Public Employer Relations Commission, therefore, to construe the public employer legislative body's role in the impasse process in a manner that recognizes the employee organization's lack of alternatives once negotiations have deadlocked. A strict duty of fairness upon the public employer legislative body satisfies that objective. If a public employer legislative body fails to maintain a fair posture or fail to consider the interest of public employees involved, then the Public Employer Relations Commission is entitled to find that the body has committed an unfair labor practice, notwithstanding its dual capacity. So commissioners, what, what this 
introduction is to tell you is that in this setting tonight, you have to sort of take off the hat that you may otherwise have of being biased toward or, or, or uh, toward the position of the city manager and what he and his staff have to say. And instead, you have to come to this proceeding as you do with your quasi-judicial proceedings, viewing towards hearing both sides out and then deciding what you believe each of you is in the best interest of the community. So with that said, you have uh, already been provided, I, I believe, but I'll review very quickly the, the agreed order of procedure. Uh, the, the union's attorney and the manager's attorney conferred prior to this uh, meeting and agreed on this proced procedure. And it starts off with each attorney being able to uh, make a brief opening statement. That'll be followed by the union's attorney having the opportunity of up to 45 minutes to present on each of the impasse issues. That will be followed then by the city's, uh, by the city manager's attorney having 45 minutes to present on, on her view and, and the administration's view of the impasse issues. Each party shall then have three minutes to question any of the persons who have presented for the either side. Then the fifth step in the process would be the union's rebuttal, then the city's rebuttal. And finally, the union and the city will each make closing arguments of a brief nature on each of the impasse issues. Once that is finished, then the matter will return to the commission and the commission will, will uh, go into executive session and discuss each of the impasse issues. Uh, I do note that at any point in the process, the parties have agreed that any commissioner who may have questions uh, may simply ask them, pose them, uh, and they can be addressed at that time. Does any commissioner have any questions as to the process or their role tonight? I do, Mr. Eschenfelder. This is Coast of Atticotis. Is this considered a quasi-judicial process or not? It is not. It is like a quasi-judicial process in that there are two sides that are presenting their cases, there are time limits, but uh, there is no under oath testimony. And most, the, the largest difference is that a true quasi-judicial process allows for a appeal to the circuit court afterwards. In this particular setting, you're, you're resolving this matter as a, in a legislative capacity, not as a judicial capacity. Um, you can consider matters and evidence that is outside of what you hear tonight. If you know about that, uh, just from, from your general knowledge or your own personal research. Uh, so it is like a quasi-judicial process, but legally speaking, it is not a quasi-judicial process. Does that answer your question? Yes, um, I have another question. Uh, the executive summary that, they gave, that you gave us uh, late this afternoon, was that agreed to by both sides? Um, in as much as the, the mayor, typically in my experience, uh, the, the, the party's positions have been uh, transferred to the governing board well in advance of the hearing. But when I discovered talking with the mayor today that that had not occurred, uh, I asked the, the manager's attorney uh, to provide an executive summary. She did attempt to reach out to the union to get them to review it and agree to it. But by the afternoon, having not heard back from the union, we did transmit what transmit what we believe to be the final position of both the manager and the union. Uh, Ms. Lone is, is of course on the, on the line and if she wishes to now indicate that she's reviewed it and does agree with the statement of the issue, she's welcome to. Thank you, Mr. Eschenfelder. I would only say that unfortunately the management attorney, and I, I hate to start off this way because I feel like we've had a really positive interaction so far, but that executive summary was provided to me two hours before I was supposed to respond. And we've been preparing witnesses and meeting with police officers all day. So while I didn't see anything glaring in the executive summary that management provided, and I certainly believe that Ms. Miranda and Ms. Jackson have acted ethically and very clearly, I did not have an opportunity to collaborate with them on that document since it was provided to me late today. Um, Mr. Eschenfelder, um, when would be the opportunity for uh, Ms. Lon to 
add anything that she might feel is absent to this so we can have a level playing field or she may choose not to do so at this time? It, well, it, it's her case to present. And so whenever we move to the union's uh, 45 minute presentation, she will present to you what she believes her, her final position was and, and the position that she feels. And we can all look at the documents. It's only three bullet points. So it's not highly complex uh, as to what the union's last position was and the manager's last position was. And so certainly as she's going through that, if she notes something that's uh, on the, the executive summary that she feels is, is different from what her position is, she can note it at that time. Um, the reason, one of the reasons I'm asking is that um, I've had the uh, PBA contract for some time and I've studied it. So I'm very familiar with it in addition to what was provided about uh, at the same time late this afternoon. But in the executive summary, there's questions concerning some of the information and I don't know who to ask questions of or do we ask questions of that at this point? Was this just informational and we should rely on the presentations? I, I think it's highly likely that as you hear the presentations from Ms. Lone and Ms. Jackson, a lot of those questions will just be answered to you. So it'd probably be best for efficiency if you hold those. But if, it, if, if either attorney gets near the end of their presentations and your question still isn't answered, then by all means, just interject and pose the question. And you can pose the question to both attorneys if you feel that both deserve to answer it. Thank you, that's all. Um, Mr. Ensefelder, I have a question to ask you. Uh, as you know, tonight we all we have four members of the BOC. What happens if we have a tied voting? It's two to two. Well, if it's tied voting, th that you're required under the statute to address each of the impasse issues. So it's kind of like what a judge would tell a, a hung jury or a, a jury that can't reach a verdict. Uh, I would ask you to go back into the jury room and try again <laughs> uh, to debate amongst yourselves. Um, you, you do have the tie vote policy that is the typical tie vote policy uh, where the matter is kicked to the next meeting. Um, but in this particular case, unless both parties, uh, the attorney for the manager and the attorney for the union uh, stipulate and agree to that, then under the statute, each of the impasse issues needs to be resolved one way or the other tonight. Thank you. I don't have any more questions. I don't know if anybody else has. I've got a quick question. There's a lot of people I don't recognize on the screen. Can we just do a quick introduction of who's who so we know who people are? I know Mr. Lemons is with the union. Um, is that okay, Mr. Eschenfelder? Yes, absolutely. I don't know where to start. So Mr. Lemon, you're with the police union, correct? Correct. I'm Detective Chris Lemon with Tarpon Springs Police Department. The union representative for the Tarpon Springs Police Officers. Okay, great, thank you. And is it Ms. Lone, is that right? Hi, it's Ms. Lone. I'm the Hi. general counsel and executive director for the Suncoast PBA. That PBA includes the Tarpon Springs Police Officers. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. I see, uh, I see Chief and Major Young and then um, is it Miss Miranda? Is that right? Yes. Good evening. Um, me and Miss Jackson represent the city. Okay, you're in the city. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. And then Miss Jackson, you're with the city too, then, right? Yes, Aaron Jackson with the city of Tarpon Springs. I'm with Johnson Jackson Law Firm, and we work with the city on labor and employment matters. Okay. Got it. All right. And I think that's everybody. So, thank you. So Mr. Mayor, if there, if there are no other questions, uh, are you prepared to move ahead? Yes, sir. Okay, then uh, we'll start with uh, the, uh, Ms. Loan gets 45 minutes to present the union's uh, uh, case on each impasse issue. Thank you. I'd like to start with an opening statement. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners, good evening. Today is not about me and you've already heard my brief introduction, but I thought I should introduce myself since I'm a new face to your city. My name is Sasha Lone. I'm the general counsel and executive director for the Sun Coast Police Benevolent Association, which represents about 1,200 law enforcement officers who collectively police about a million and a half citizens across the state of Florida. 
As I prepared for tonight's hearing on behalf of the brave and hardworking men and women who make up the Tarpon Springs Police Department, I wanted to say thank you. We've all been on so many Zoom calls and the tendency towards fatigue and complete saturation is real. We know that and we wanna thank you for your time and attention tonight. Thank you for listening to us. This session will come down to a decision regarding how you wanna spend taxpayer money. I submit to you there is no place more important for Tarpon Springs to spend its funds than on these men and women who come to work every day knowing they could give their lives for any one of us, for any one of your constituents at any time. This is not a group of people who wanna scream and bang on tables. I certainly am not your traditional union lawyer. Um, the men and women who you'll hear from tonight, they just wanna do their jobs. They are your officers, your detectives, and your sergeants. The union and these officers have been efficient and straightforward throughout this negotiating process. We are asking for three things, a 3% general wage increase effective October 1st, 2020, a 5% specialty pay incentive for the detective unit personnel effective October 1st, 2020, and a provision which simply empowers the chief or his designee to move school resource officers, the logistics officer, the community policing officer and the administrative sergeants to a 42 hour work week, effective October 1st, 2020. Beyond that, these men and women are just asking for their old contract as written. No changes to the step plan, no shift differential, no special health care incentive, no changes to their other benefits. So to be clear, this isn't some complex negotiating strategy. We're asking for what we need and nothing more. We researched our requests and they're based on the competing law enforcement agencies around us. And you know, maybe we should have padded our ask. Maybe we should have asked for more than what we wanted. Maybe we should have asked for the moon, but we didn't. We're not trying to hide the ball. We're not trying to get more than is fair. There is no fat in the three bullet points that are in front of you. There's nothing to cut. These are things that impact the future of the police department, its ability to recruit new talent and its ability to retain its veteran talent, its ability to recognize the incredible, incredible determination and grit it takes to be a police officer in 2020 and in all the years that will follow. The officers who you see on that camera all have families. Many of them have small children. They leave their own kids at home to protect other people's kids. They leave their own families at home to patrol, even during the coronavirus. Remember, they didn't and they don't get to stay home and shelter. They don't have the luxury of social distancing when they make an arrest or prevent a suicide or help a baby. They work every day, every night, and every holiday. And frankly, without them and without the public safety they ensure for the city, what does Tarpon Springs have? What will its other accomplishments mean? Public safety, as you know, is an economic issue too. Invest in them, please. Right now, these officers are waiting without a contract. Their contract ended 13 days ago. They have not received their step in pay to recognize another year of service to the city. They are waiting for you. They bypassed an old and cumbersome process to get to you because they believe in you and they work for you. Please send them home tonight with a contract that recognizes their service, their dedication, and your belief in them. That's my opening, sir. Ms. Lowe, may I ask a question, please? Absolutely, Commissioner. Um, I, I, uh, there's one more overriding question that I have. In the executive summary that we were given, it says that the parties have agreed to a one-year contract effective uh, October 20th through October, uh, I'm sorry, uh, through September um, 2021. Um, we're not talking about a five-year contract tonight then? Correct, Commissioner. And I would, I would probably feel that that's best a question directed to Mr. Eschenfelder since he's to provide you legal counsel, but yes. The, the parties are only asking you for a one-year contract effective October 1st, 2020 to September 30th of 2021. Who, who can I, Mr. Eschenfelder, I'm sorry, who can I ask the question of why a one-year contract and not a five-year contract? Well, Commissioner, under the, the statute, you cannot have anything longer than a three-year contract. So 
years. So you really can't have a five-year contract. But um, the, the strategy of why a union would accept one, two, or three years or ask for one, two, or three years and why management would offer one, two, or three years can vary year on to year. Uh, if economic situations are good, bad, uh, if it's anticipated that things are gonna change drastically, let's say for instance that an agent, uh, a union knows that a, uh, the agency that, that it is serving is about to raise its taxes by 50%, which I know Tarpon's not, but, but uh, it may say, well, we're only one, one year contract because we know that in, in the next year, the city's gonna have a heck of a lot more money. So we'll be able to negotiate that at that time. Conversely, if the union says, well, geez, we kind of know that things may be going downhill and we would like to, to build in some security, they may want a, a three-year contract. So it's a process of negotiation between management and the union during the negotiation sessions. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so I, I, uh, I, I stand corrected. The uh, previous com contract was from 2017 through 2020, and now we're talking about a one-year contract. Correct. All right, well, <laughs> thank you. I wish it was longer, but that's okay. Thank you. I had a quick question for just the basics of what a step plan is. Um, if you could just touch on that and what the difference is between a step plan and then a wage increase as well for me, please. Commissioner Carr, is that question for me, Sasha? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I want to just make sure I'm happy to answer that, but I believe the city has an opportunity to do its opening. And I'm going to put on witnesses that will talk about the step plan versus the general wage increase. Would you prefer to hear Mr. Eschenfelder from the other opening and then come back to Commissioner Carr's question? Yeah, it's probably best. Let's go ahead and let Ms. Jackson make her opening and then Ms. Lone's going to begin presenting her case. And it's likely that that question will be answered, Commissioner Carr, Vice Mayor Carr, at that time. So Excuse Jackson, me, I didn't mean to demote you, uh, Vice Mayor. Ms. Jackson, you want to go ahead and make your opening statement? Thank you. Good evening. I'm Erin Jackson and I represent the City of Parkland Springs and Labor and Employment Matters. Tonight, I'm here to talk with you on behalf of the city manager regarding the negotiations and the impasse issues that are before you. I'd like to begin tonight with why we're here, because I think it's important that we all understand the task of the commission. tonight. The legislature says that the overwhelming object of your labor tonight is to make a decision that is in the public interest. And that includes the public employees, but clearly is not exclusively the public employees. The commission doesn't have the luxury of just looking at numbers alone tonight. Rather, the commission is charged with the responsibility of taking action on behalf of the public interest. And tonight you're going to hear from the city administration about the issues that you'll need to resolve based on the union's declaration of impasse during the contract negotiation. Those issues primarily resolve around wages for the union members. Tonight, what needs to be decided is what is appropriate resolution for the dispute for the fiscal year that we are now in. The contract expired on September 30th. The negotiations began in June and the negotiations were for a three-year contract. When the union um, filed for impasse, the statute states that the commission can only impose uh, for a one year, one fiscal year. And during negotiations, uh, the city has offered a 3% increase to union members for the first year of the contract. Now, I, I was here and listening to the public comment, and I'm not sure why in the public comment there's a, an understanding that a 3% increase was not offered. The 3% was offered to the police, just as it was awarded to all of the other city employees. It is an increase at a time when the world is very uncertain. The city manager worked diligently to avoid furloughs and layoffs that I'm sure we've all seen and heard about all too often. He and Mr. Herring, who we'll hear from as well tonight, dug deep to find areas in the budget to freeze, including the operating budget and areas of cap capital expenditures. They also worked hard to present you all with a budget that was balanced and without having to go into the city's unassigned fund balance reserves. Those reserves are maintained for economic downturns and emergency situations 
so that the city can respond quickly and nimbly. Maintaining adequate reserves is critical and takes discipline and strategic planning. It's for infrastructure and public safety. It's utilized to pay for first responders who would come in after an emergency situation. It is maintained for the public interest. One hurricane and the unassigned fund balance could all be gone. And on top of that, COVID has had an extreme impact on the revenues of the city. Management, being mindful of these uncertainties at the table, has offered a 3% increase the first year and asked that the union not increase on the step plan for the first year. But it went beyond that and also offered a 1.25% cost of living increase for years two and three on top of the step plan for years two and three and offered the opportunity to come back to the table in years two and three to talk some more. Management is simply asking for one year of a flat 3% so that we have time to ride this wave and to see what happens, hopefully on the other side of COVID. We just don't know what to expect going forward. The city is simply asking that the union accept the 3% as the other city employees did, and then come back to the table once we know more. The union has refused to accept that and instead is asking for more today. The union is asking you to go beyond the budget into the emergency reserves for this money. It's important to understand that those reserves are there for a critical reason. The city appreciates, respect, respects, and is grateful for the sacrifices and the hard work of its officers. This is not about that. This is simply about uncertainty in an uncertain time and a request that we just wait a year, while in the meantime, giving the union members the raise that the other city employees got. The city thanks the council for its time tonight. So Ms. Lynn, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, begin with your 45 minute presentation. Uh, Mr. Eschenfeller, I have a question. Oh, sure. Jackson. Ms. Jackson, I, I, maybe you can clarify this, and I guess it is in the form of a question, the 3% um, increase that was offered, uh, that's without a, um, an increase in the step plan for fiscal year uh, 2021. Does that mean it would be 0% for the step plan or is that would be the continuation of what was in the contract for let's say 2020, the 2.5%? Um, Commissioner, uh, Chief Cochin is going to talk this evening all about the negotiations and that last offer and, and can he's the best person to answer that question for you. But okay. my understanding is that it is essentially uh, freezing the step plan just for this year so that they would not increase in the step, but there would be a guaranteed 3%. I, so I, they would not move to the next I, step, but it would be 3%. Not, I'll wait for Chief Cochin, but I'm not quite sure I'm following you because if you take if we're talking about a 0% increase in, or 0% in, uh, increase in the salary in the step plan, then we, the 3% is less than what's on the table right now in, the, in this last year's contract, but I'll, I'll wait for a better explanation. And then the other part of this is, I, I don't understand the logic behind um, the city offered to reopen negotiations on this issue. <laughs> I guess this is the basis of my question of a one-year or multi-year contract, is why are we offering to reopen the negotiations when they're gonna reopen anyway? Am I missing something here? Because it's a one-year contract. Commissioner, Commissioner, if I could try to explain. So if what the management was attempting to do is say, if you do a three-year contract, and you do this 3% that we are offering you in year one, we will put into this three-year contract the opportunity to talk about this issue again in year two and in year three. But that's only if they agree to a three-year contract. I, correct, Ms. Jackson? That is correct. Thank you. I, I guess that was my point of my questions that I had on this executive summary, Mr. Erickson-Felder, because it doesn't say anything about a three-year contract. Um, the last proposal from the city regarding impasse issues is as follows. I don't see anything in there about a three-year contract. Well, well, right. And let me, so let me speak to that. What your role is under the statute tonight is to solve the, th resolve the three disputed issues between management and the union. But you can't, 
impose that for a whole three years. Instead, you're going to impose it, either, and when I say impose, you're gonna decide it either in, in a way the manager likes or the way the union likes, but either which way, your decision lasts for just the end of the fiscal year. And then the, the parties will go back again to try to come up with a three-year contract or however many years they feel they It's just a point of clarification because we were given this executive summary and I wanna make sure that we're looking at it in a fair light for both sides. And those are the questions that I told you I had questions on before we got into uh, um, this discussion and I've held them until the uh, opening statements as you had requested. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions of commissioners? Okay, so then uh, Ms. Lone, would you like to begin your 45 minutes? I would, thank you, Mr. Eschenfelder. All right, the first person I'm gonna ask some questions of Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners is Detective Chris Lemon. Detective Lemon, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so can you please introduce yourself to the Mayor, Vice Mayor and Commissioners, tell them where you work, how long you've worked there, that kind of stuff. Hi, my name is Chris Lemon. I'm assigned to the detective unit at Tarpon Springs Police Department. Today is actually my eight year anniversary at Tarpon Springs Police Department. And uh, as I said, I'm, I'm assigned to the detective unit. I've worked there. Did anyone else have terrible feedback there on the last thing Detective Lemon said? Yes. yes. We all okay. did. Can you say that last sentence one more time, Detective? I'm with detective for been with the department for eight my anniversary. So I think we're going to have to take a pause. We seem to be having some technical difficulties hearing you, Detective. Mr. Eschenfelder, can we have about two minutes to put him in a different room? Some parts of the police department, unfortunately, despite our testing, don't have great reception. Uh, sure, unless the, unless the mayor and commission feel otherwise. Yes, we'll go ahead and do that. We should be less than two minutes. I'm just going to move them to a different room where hopefully we don't have feedback issues. I apologize to y'all. We tested this. One moment. Mayor, Board of Commissioners, we have uh, our IT division going down to help out the uh, PBA. Just to let you know. Thank you. Detective Lemon, can you hear me in that room? I want to make sure we're moving as quickly as we can for the mayor and commissioners. I think he's on, um, uh, uh, the audio's turned off. Yes, sir, I see that. Thank you. Can you hear me? Detective, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, you're a little bit quiet, so I'm going to need you to either project your voice or put the computer closer. Thank you for rolling with this. I know it's a lot of changes quickly. I feel like the Verizon guy, can you hear me now? Not really. Can you do a test for me again? Can we please mute that computer? Mute that one, Mathis. All right, let's try that again, detective. Just give us one second. Oh, perfect. Now I can hear you loud and clear. Uh, I switched to this microphone that was on the front. Okay. Oh. Great. I think we're back in action. 
All right, so Detective Lemon, can you do a one, two, three test for me just to make sure we can hear you? Sure, one, two, three, can you hear me now? I can. Can everybody else hear? Yes. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you for rolling so quickly. All right, I'll wait until everybody's back on. And then Mayor, with your permission, I'll restart. Please go ahead. Thank you. All right. All right, Detective, I'm gonna start my stopwatch to make sure I keep us on time. Let's talk about you. All right, Detective Chris Lemon, you said today is your eight year anniversary with the department? Yes, today is the eight year anniversary for when I was hired. I didn't know that. Um, all right, so what kind of work do you do at the Tarpon Springs Police Department? So I'm currently assigned to the detective division. Uh, we investigate crimes across the entire spectrum. So everything from complex fraud investigations to narcotics investigations, to trying to find missing juveniles, to everything up to and including homicide. Great. And I think this has already been mentioned, but do you volunteer in addition to your law enforcement work? And if so, where? I do. I, uh, uh, I serve as the union rep uh, for the Suncoast PBA. I represent the officers at Tarpon Springs Police Department. Um, I made that decision as far as to assume a leadership position in the, in the union following uh, the, when we lost an officer. I saw firsthand the impact that the union could have in supporting the police department, its officers, and also the families. And so I wanted to make that, that impact uh, with any officer that needed my assistance. And so that's why I became a union rep. Thank you. This is kind of a cheesy question, but it's worth asking because a lot of people go into union work because they're malcontents or they hate their police department or they, they're anti-establishment. Do you love where you work? I absolutely love where I work. Uh, this is, uh, it was, I still remember the day when I interviewed and I got the phone call. I, I was able to drive to the Tarpon Springs public parking lot before I got the phone call offering me a conditional offer uh, to work here. And it was the best day of my life then. And it still is one of the best days of my life. All right. Thank you. So I want to transition. Uh, Commissioner Vaticiotis already asked about wages and the general wage increase versus the step plan. Can you explain to us, just so everybody's working from the same sheet of music, what is a step plan and what is a general wage increase? All right. So a step plan is something that's been previously contractually obligated or contractually agreed upon. Uh, it's, it's a mechanism for allowing an officer, when you start out, you start out as, uh, at a set salary. And it's a mechanism in place that allows you to gradually increase that salary as you work your way through your career. So obviously in year one, when you first get hired, it's not going to be the same amount of money that you're working in year 20. So it's one thing for a police department to say, hey, the max pay for our officers is 90000 or 80000 But there has to be some sort of mechanism in place to take you from that starting salary to that top out pay. And so that's what a step plan is. It's also the important part of the step plan is it's, it's designed to prevent there from being compression, which means the last thing that you want is for an officer that just got hired to be getting paid the same amount as an officer that has a wealth of experience that has been here 12 years serving his community or her community. Thank you for that clarification. I like that pronoun shift. All right, so how long is Tarpon Springs Police Department's step plan? How many years does it take before you hit the top? So our step plan is currently 20 years. Uh, that's in comparison to other departments in the area, such as Tampa, where it's 11, St. Pete, 13, Clearwater, 13, or the sheriff's office is 17. So ours is currently 20. And uh, that's why, like earlier today, one of the commissioners was mentioning that our step plan would be frozen. Uh, that's one that obviously had a significant impact for us because we're already looking across neighboring agencies and surrounding agencies and our top out is already uh, well beyond some of those agencies as far as the amount of years it takes. So to, to freeze that and have us go an additional year definitely is something that uh, um, impacted us when we reviewed that proposal. So when we looked at that proposal together, just to squarely try to answer that question, the city's proposal at some point was for a 3% GWI, but it said no movement on the step plan. So stop on the step plan, you get a 0% on your step plan if you'll agree to that, then we'll give you a 3% general wage increase, correct? That's correct. All right. Um, I want to ask you a little bit, just to explain, I think we have the general idea. The step plan is the way you progress through the pay scale by years of service. So a year one officer makes X, a year two officer makes X plus one, et cetera, right? That's correct. Let's compare that to a general wage increase. What is a general wage increase? 
So general wage increase is just a set raise across the board for, for all police officers. Got it. And are you aware whether the city has offered a general wage increase to its non-sworn, non-police employees? Yes, they have. And what was that amount? 3%. Another thing I want to ask you that's not on the table today, but just I want to kind of flesh out the ways that a police department can pay its personnel. So another another area that a police department or a city can use to pay its personnel is shift differential, correct? That's correct. And we're not asking for that tonight, but it's relevant to talk about for comparing us to different uh, law enforcement agencies around Pinellas County, right? That, that's right. Okay, so what is a shift differential? What does that mean? We even heard some public comment on it. So shift differential is just uh, extra compensation that is provided for officers or deputies uh, at other departments for if they work overnight. Um, the reason that you provide shift differential is obviously if you're, if you're working overnight, uh, if your wife or significant other, or your kids are going to school or working uh, and you're working overnight, you're sleeping during the day. So you may not, you may not see them. Um, it, all, it has working overnights, it, uh, unless you've done it, for anybody that's done it in other, in other fields or other works, it takes a toll on you both physically and mentally. So uh, it's a way of providing extra incentive and compensation for those officers that undertake um, that shift, because obviously it's needed. It's not, you can't do police work between eight and four. Uh, there, there needs to be a presence, obviously, during the, the overnight hours. And tonight, and in this proposal, I just want to be clear, we are not asking for shift differential. That's not one of the things that we're asking about, but we wanted to make sure that the mayor and commissioners understood that if we compare Tarpon Springs PD to other local law enforcement agencies, they may have similar base pay, but they have employees that are making 10% more on top of their base pay if they work midnights, correct? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, you can... Uh, uh... You can just simply look at base pay numbers comparing us to Pinellas County Sheriff's Office, but that doesn't, like you say, it doesn't take into consideration the fact that they provide 10% shift differential to any of their officers that work overnight, and our agency provides uh, no additional benefit. And is it also true that those other law enforcement agencies often provide a shift differential even for people who work what's called afternoons, which is the evening but not overnight shift? That is correct. And we are not asking for that, correct? That's correct. We're just trying to obviously provide a full understanding of how we stack up with surrounding surrounding departments. And so that transitions me into this idea, why do we care about any of this, right? Like, why are we talking about the different ways that people can get paid? And why is that? Is it relevant to recruiting and retention? And why is that relevant to the mayor, the vice mayor, and commissioners? Like, I can tell you to start off, it, obviously, it's, it's uncomfortable talking about money because I don't think there's anybody sitting behind me. I don't think there's any officer, hopefully no officer that goes into this job that their, their driving force behind them becoming a police officer or going to law enforcement is money. That wasn't my focus. That wasn't my, my reason for going to law enforcement. But at the end of the day, if we're not competitive from a salary and benefit standpoint with these surrounding departments, and when I say surrounding departments, I'm talking the same county, I'm talking, 15 minutes to the south, you're talking Clearwater Police Department or the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office or a 30 minute drive to work for Tampa. Uh, what we risk is we risk losing, we risk one, recruiting officers to first come to Tarpon because they're going to look at the difference from a salary and benefit standpoint with us and other departments and they're gonna simply go to Pinellas first or Tampa first, or we're gonna really struggle to retain that qualified and experienced officer that this city invests so much into for training and those officers that establish the relationships with their members in the community uh, we're going to lose that because they're going to end up going to these other departments that pay significantly more and provide benefits that simply don't exist at Tarpon Springs Police Department. So when we're talking about this three percent general wage increase and keeping the steps in place and asking for the 5% detective specialty pay, which we're gonna talk about momentarily, we're not just talking about police officers, right? We're talking about the community that they serve because if Tarpon Springs can't recruit and retain talented law enforcement, that impacts the mayor and vice mayor and commissioner's constituents, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you when you start thinking about the, uh, the inability to recruit 
that goes with also the ability to recruit uh, the most qualified and also diverse candidates for law enforcement. So we want to be able to provide, obviously, uh, a competitive salary, competitive benefits so that we can get the most qualified, the most diverse candidate. Um, and we're not looking at all these other departments getting those best candidates, and then we're, we're left trying to choose with what's left. That's the last thing you want in this world. That's the last thing you want with the type of job that we have, with the responsibilities that are an inherent part of it. It's expensive to pick from the bottom of the barrel, is it not? Exactly. And I just, I, I don't want to see that because this department has, from what I understand, I've been here eight years, so I can only go off what I've heard prior to uh, where we used to be, I guess, classified as a training ground for other police departments. And since I've been here, uh, that hasn't been the case. So I don't want to see that revert back to that. I like the fact that we have a wealth of experience that you can see behind me. And so when you're going to these high stress calls, such as if you go to an active shooter, you're not getting someone that's just been on the police department for a year and a half, that's never been to a, a high risk call or never had to take his gun out of his holster. You're getting someone that potentially has 15, 20 years of experience, possibly has SWAT experience. That's the person you want going to an active shooter. You don't want someone that's only been on here one year that's still trying to find their footing as a police officer. You want them to be able to look to their peers and be surrounded by officers that have that wealth of experience so they can follow behind them and learn from those officers. And if you don't provide competitive salaries and benefits, you lose those officers that basically are the leaders of your police department. What about the cynical person, Detective Lemon, that would say, well, once we've got a police officer here at Tarpon, they're not gonna leave. It doesn't matter what we pay them, they're not gonna go. What do you say to that? I would say that, I, I'm not a math guy. If anybody knows me, I, I got a bachelor's in English and then I went and got a law degree, but I, I was never good at math. But as part of my role as a union rep, I had to research the salaries of these other departments, the benefits for these other departments. I never really paid attention to that because I told you that my motive for becoming a police officer was not financially driven. So I didn't realize until I started undertaking the, the, the study of these other departments in the surrounding area, uh, just how far we've we've fallen behind those departments. And so even not being a math guy, when you start looking at differences between us and other departments, and it's $20,000, $30,000, $40,000 a difference uh, a year, uh, I got to start factoring in what sort of difference that can make for my family. And so it may not be the overdriving consideration for my choice as far as where I work, but it's got to be some sort of consideration. And I think anybody that's ever gone into any sort of work, any sort of career, uh, at the end of the day, you're still going to factor, you're still going to consider finances, especially when you start getting into numbers like $20,000, $30,000, $40,000 difference. I wanted to highlight too, one of the things that you just brought up was, and we, we glossed over it, but it's super important, this relationship that gets built between veteran police officers, like some of the guys and, and girls behind you, and the communities that they serve. Is that a fungible thing that doesn't matter? Like if a police officer spends eight years or 10 years or 15 years in Tarpon Springs and they, they vest in some portion of their pension and then they leave, how does that impact their community relationships and the department's ability to solve crime for its businesses and residents? It can't be, it can't be stated how important that relationship is and it takes time. That isn't something that gets developed overnight. That's something where that's something where you're interacting with those community members time and time again, and they learn to trust you. And as far as from an investigative standpoint, like I said, I'm the sign of the detective unit. So the fact that that I know a lot of times the the, the suspects that we're, we're investigating for these crimes, it's the same suspects over and over again. And so I'm really well aware uh, of those individuals. And so one of the comment, commenters mentioned a, uh, a recent shooting. Uh, that investigation, the reason that it was able to be successful is because of the fact that so many of the officers understand and have relationships both with the, with the members of our community, can, can obviously reach out to them to develop witnesses, can speak to them. And then also the fact that uh, we know the suspects, so we know where they're going to hide. We know who they associate with. We, we know everything about them. And so that's how we're able to get such quick resolution to, to an incident like a shooting that happened recently. And like I said, you, you can't do that if you simply 
have been here six months. You just, you don't have that same level of knowledge that you have when you've been here 15, 20 years and you know the nicknames, you know everything there is to know about the, the, the prolific offenders that are the ones that we truly need to be putting away. So we've talked about now the general wage increase request and how a general wage increase is contrasted and also complementary to a step plan. I want to transition us to talking about specialty pay. And I also want to be mindful of our time together since we only have 45 minutes. So can you explain for all of us what a specialty pay is since we're requesting a 5% specialty pay for the members of the personnel of the detective unit? All right, so the specialty pay for our detective unit, um, we're, we're on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, each of us carries two cell phones with us. And at any given moment, we can get a phone call that says, hey, there was a shooting or there was a homicide. And uh, we're expected to be there. We, we don't have the, the luxury of saying that, hey, you know what? I, I realize a homicide just occurred, but it's Christmas morning and uh, my kid hasn't unwrapped his present yet. Um, what that means in the detective unit is uh, we were going to celebrate Christmas on the 25th, but we're going to now celebrate on the 26th. That's, that's not me making a complaint. That's just an inherent part of police work. And it's definitely an inherent part of being a detective. Um, it's that understanding that no matter what we do, we always have to factor in that we can get called in at a moment's notice. So no matter where I go, I have a change of clothes. I have um, plans as far as who can potentially watch my two-year-old at two in the morning when I get a phone call that I didn't realize I was going to need a babysitter for. Um, so when we ask for that extra compensation, it's because of being on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's because of the stress of having a caseload where you're investigating crimes such as homicides and quite possibly uh, the difference between you doing a quality investigation and not doing a quality investigation is whether or not a family will get justice for a lost loved one. Um, so when we start looking at detective specialty pay, we, we said 5%. Uh, it's an arbitrary number because the fact of the matter is the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office provides 10% to their detectives. The Tampa, the Tampa Police Department uh, considers it a promotion and the difference between a six-year detective in Tampa and a six-year detective in Tarpon is 42, over $42,000 a year. Um, so when, I, when we said 5%, it was really more of just trying to gradually get us, make progress to the fact that right now, uh, in historically, the Texas at Tarpon have been provided absolutely no extra compensation, even though obviously what I've described to you is a tremendous, um, tremendous amount more responsibility than, than what uh, a regular patrol officer is, is asked to, uh, to handle. I also wanted to ask you about that. So the detective specialty pay is meant to say, it's meant to recognize that you're at a two drink minimum or two drink maximum for your life, right? Because you have to be on call and available to work on a homicide, a suicide, a child abduction at any moment, correct? That's correct. I mean, every, every aspect of our, of our lives is, is dictated by the fact that we're on call. So like we, we have a small detective unit. So when one of the detectives says, hey, I'm planning on going out of town this weekend, that means the rest of us aren't doing anything that weekend. Cause we know that uh, we can't afford to get that call from our Sergeant Saturday night or early Sunday morning at two in the morning and tell him that, hey, you know what? I realized we just had a shooting, uh, but I'm not available. Th those, those words just don't exist to us. And I mean, they're not gonna exist one way or the other, because obviously we take pride in our job and, and serve in our community. But uh, it, what it comes down to is the, the feeling of feeling valued. Uh, obviously these other departments in our area provide that, they value their detectives and we're just simply asking for the same. I also wanted to point out again, because we wanna be clear, one of the things that I think management may be inclined to say is that this is about payment for you guys and I want to make sure we're connecting what we're asking for towards how you are keeping the community safe. And so if you don't offer a 5% or some sort of specialty pay to incentivize people to do that extra work, do you fear that there may be an, a lapse in the kind of person that applies for that detective unit? Exactly. I mean, like anything else, you want your most qualified and best candidate to, to go to that position. You don't want them to be factoring in uh, finances when they're when you're deciding who's going to be investigating the next homicide in Tarpon Springs. You want your best candidate. You want your most experienced candidate. And the last thing you want is to have a detective that's potentially been in the detective unit for five, six years 
take the wealth of experience and knowledge that they have and take those same sort of uh, abilities to Pinellas County Sheriff's Office or the Tampa Police Department and start benefiting those those communities uh, just because simply they're they're valued from a salary and benefit standpoint. Thank you. I wanted to ask you just two more questions, Detective. One as to assignment pay. So we've talked a lot. One of the comparables for Tarpon Springs Police Department is the Sheriff's Office, because that's the place where we lose a lot of candidates, both at the recruitment stage and at the retention stage, correct? That's correct. Okay, so I'm gonna read off a list of things that the Sheriff's Office pays its personnel for, and I'm gonna ask you if Tarpon Springs pays its personnel for those things. The amounts of money here range from about $800 to about $2,600, all right? So I'm gonna read them off, not the numbers, but the types of things. These are all of the different assignment pays that are specialty pays that the Sheriff's Office pays its people. And I'm gonna ask you if Tarpon Springs pays its people for these duties. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, uh, PCSO pays its armorer a specialty pay. Does that happen at Tarpon Springs? No. PCSO pays its clandestine drug people a specialty pay. Does Tarpon Springs? No. Command bus driver gets paid at PCSO. Does that happen at Tarpon? No. The dive team who dives into ponds and lakes that are blacked out with seaweed and gunk where there's alligators, snakes, dead bodies, and guns. PCSO pays a specialty pay for that. Does Tarpon Springs? No. What about the honor guard at PCSO that's paid a specialty pay? Does the honor guard get a specialty pay at Tarpon Springs? No, ma'am. What about the major accident investigation team? They get a specialty pay at PCSO. Do they at Tarpon Springs? No. What about the mental health people or the negotiators? They get paid a specialty pay at PCSO. Do they get paid anything extra at Tarpon Springs? No. What about SWAT? Do you have a SWAT team? Yes, we do. Do they get paid a specialty pay to respond out to the most dangerous calls in Tarpon Springs? No. We're not asking for any of that, correct? That's correct. But if someone were to say that we are paying our police officers similar to what the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office is paying its deputies, would that be accurate based on this list? Not only would it not be accurate, but I think it'd be disingenuous. All right, I'm gonna share my screen real quickly with you and bear with me. If this doesn't work, I need just a second. I hope you're not seeing a picture of my dog right now, but I think you are. Yeah. <laughs> okay, That's, I'll remember that for next time. <laughs> All right, Detective Lemon, walk me through and walk the mayor and commissioners through this slide, please. What is this comparable that you created for them? Uh, so what you're seeing is the a breakdown comparing us to the Tampa Police Department it's, pro it's providing their steps. Uh, what I want you to focus on, because I mean, obviously there's a lot of information on that slide. It's just that Tampa PD, Tampa PD uh, tops out at step 11. So 11 years into the career. Again, Tarpon Springs Police Department is 20 and potentially with their prospective contract offer would be 21. Uh, the other important thing to look at is the step plan for detectives. Like I said, Tampa Police Department, the value they place on the detectives is they actually consider a promotion and so they have a specific step plan for their detectives. So that's where you end up getting the comparison that I explained to you, where you have a six year senior detective in Tarpon, in Tampa that's making $42,000 a year more than what a comparable senior detective in Tarpon PD would be making. Got it. All right, I'm gonna take us to the next slide. What does this say about what's happening at Tampa PD? Just gives a breakdown of their their recent contracts. So it shows that Tampa PD received a three percent raise on top of their steps in 2019, three percent raise in 2020 on top of their steps, and the same in 2021. Uh, the important thing also is obviously not just simply to look at the base pay, but also understand that Tampa PD provides shift differential, um, which uh, is an additional benefit that um, that simply isn't provided at Tarpon. All right, Detective, I'm recognizing that of the time that we've allotted together, we've got about three minutes left. So I'm going to skip us to uh, Pinellas County Sheriff's Office and then take us back to St. Pete. Can you explain right, so, what's on this slide? So Pinellas, you can see the, the same thing. Obviously, they top out at 17. Again, we're, we're topping out at 20. Uh, the From a salary standpoint, if you just simply look at the numbers, it appears that we're somewhat in line with the, the Sheriff's Office. 
Um, like I said, like what I want to focus on is the fact that we're not providing ship, we're not providing shift differential, not providing uh, detective specialty pay. Obviously, she spoke about a, uh, an assortment of specialty positions that Pinellas provides payment for. So I think there's very few people at the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office that are making base pay, whereas there's many more of those, um, essentially everyone at Tarpon PD. All right, I'm going to take us to St. Pete. St. PPD, you can see that they top out at uh, step 13. I know on my end it's a little fuzzy, but it's uh, step 13, and uh, uh, you can you can see the the differences between the salaries. Uh, St. PPD, you can see the raises that they're offering. Uh, these are in addition to the steps, so 4% in 2019, 3, 3. Um, the increase that they're providing is 12 to 26% of the three-year term of the contract. So. Uh, I guess you can just go to the next slide and then we'll summarize. Our next slide is, takes us to a different, to PCSO. Okay, so Pinellas SO who recently uh, provided their contract, obviously they were facing, they uh, ended up uh, having this contract done in the same financial environment that we're currently facing. Uh, they provided a three wage increase on top of the steps that they had. Uh, this allowed their officers to get anywhere between three and 7% in the next fiscal year. And they maintained having chip differential and then also the 10% uh, detective specialty pay. Um, they also have ancillary benefits such as uh, health insurance uh, when their members retire, which you can imagine the, the, the amount of value that that uh, provides their membership. They also pay out uh, up to 100% of sick time, up to 1,280 hours uh, when their officers retire. So a lot of their benefits are designed to try to retain their officers, not just simply for five years, not for 10 years, but for their entire career, because they understand the value that has both to, to their department and to the community they represent. I wanna take you to the last slide here when we compared detective pay. So what, what this is showing is what we've discussed before is the for detective specialty pay, the difference between us and Tampa um, with the same level of detective is over $40,000. Um, obviously, we're not Tampa, but what, these, what this study did and what this examination looking at Pinellas, St. Pete, Clearwater, uh, Largo, what it provided is that not only are we not competitive with Tampa, we're not competitive with anyone in Pinellas County that we're currently risking losing both on when it comes to recruitment and retain. And those are the sort of the numbers you look to is the fact that the difference between us just simply on base salary to, between these departments is 15, 20 and $30,000 a year. And it's just very tough to compete uh, when you start talking about those sort of numbers. Thank you, Detective. Can you bring Sergeant Mathis to your seat, please? Yes. Good evening, Sergeant Mathis. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for being here with us. Um, brief bio from you, please, sir. Where do you work? How long have you worked there? And what do you do? I'm Treen Mathis, a, a patrol sergeant here at Tarpon Springs PD. Been here for 12 and a half years. I don't think there's anybody more Tarpon than I am in this room <laughs> on the Zoom call. And uh, right now I'm assigned to patrol, but prior to that, I was uh, part of the SRO unit as well. All right, I'm gonna jump right in, Sergeant Mathis, and I wanna preface this by saying some of the questions that I have for you are sensitive and strange and hard, and we're moving really quickly on a Zoom call at 7.54 at night. So I want you to just pretend like it's me and you talking and there's not a billion other people looking at us, okay? Okay. All right, what does it mean to be a police officer for you in 2020? For me, it's a very, complicated perspective that I see on both ends, given the current climate in America and policing, uh, especially dealing with minority communities. I get the privilege to see it on both ends as an officer and as an African-American male who happens to do this job for a living. And it is an issue that is very tough sometimes to talk about. It is an issue that is very difficult to deal with. However, uh, Policing for me, you know, again, it's very complicated, but uh, today 
more than ever, uh, we need more policing and more people who look like me doing this job. How many people look like you at the Tarpon Springs Police Department? Me. This is it. You're the only African-American police officer at the Tarpon Springs Police Department. I am. So and I want to talk to you about, no, please, go ahead. And that, that makes it tough because the men and women you see behind me uh, call me a lot. And especially when things happen in our minority community to help solve issues that happen within that community. And what that does when you're the only one that looks like you at an agency is it puts you in a very tough position, both at home and professionally, where my kids have to hear things that have gone on and decisions that I've made that adversely impacts them. But it's the right thing for us to do. So it's tough um, when you look like me and you're the only one that looks like me to have to go and handle some of these tough situations. So that brings me, Sergeant, to the matter of recruiting because remember, we're not talking about a wage contract because you all are a bunch of greedy jerks that just want to get rich off policing, right? Um, right. I know I'm being silly, but I, I want you to connect this. Why is it important that this 3% general wage increase contract with the SIP plan and the 5% detective specialty pay goes through? What does that do for your ability to recruit other people of color into law enforcement? It allows me to reach out and be competitive to get those men and women into this agency and show them what we're all about and hopefully keep them here. Right now, it's tough. And as Detective Limit said earlier, when we get them, we're getting, we don't want the bottom of the barrel. We want a quality candidate. And the only way to recruit and retain quality candidates is by compensating them fairly. And right now we're just not keeping up. So I can't compete with St. Pete PD. I can't compete with Tampa PD. I can't compete with the Sheriff's Office. When you throw $15,000 difference in front of a young man or woman that's coming out of college, that's a huge cost of living. That's a huge difference in their quality of life. So these things are important in order to recruit and retain quality applicants. I know you also, you kind of said this jokingly earlier, but you're kind of Mr. Tarpon Springs. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so have, do you have good relationships with people in the business community in Tarpon Springs? I do. And have they asked you why there aren't more people of color in law enforcement at the city? They have. They and what have you to told them? You know, it's, you know, I don't want to say it's pay because that, that doesn't look good for the city. So I protect the city's interest, but I tell them we're trying and we're, and that's all I can tell them as we go behind the scenes to find these ca these candidates to bring them in here. But you, you don't want to make the city look bad and say, you know, we just don't pay them enough. It doesn't look good. So as a voice of the city and the community, I just say, hey, we're trying and we go looking. And we have, but we can't keep them. We can't get them here. What would it mean to you? The city's last offer was a 3% general wage increase, but they said if you accepted that 3% general wage increase, you had to freeze on the steps and turn a 20 year step plan into a 21 year step plan. What does that mean oh. for a man like you with kids and a wife that's trying to work your way to the top of this wage? How do I look a young applicant in the face and say, hey, it's going to take you 20, 21 years here to top out and pay while raising a family when you can go down the street and do it in 11, 13, 17 years and get extra money on top of that and uh, get those those ancillary benefits that we all talk about. Uh, it's tough. And having a family, it's tough to look the guys around me in the face and say, hey, it's going to take 20 years to max out. Let's get you in here and bring you here. It's not it's not a. We don't have a fair shot at those applicants. Thank you, Sergeant. I don't have anything further for you unless there's something I forgot to ask you. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Can you bring up Detective Scarpati, please? Hi, Detective. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Can you take your mask off so we can see your face? I can. Thank you. All right. Are you comfortable? You have enough space in there. Yes. Okay, good. So can you briefly, I'm just mindful of our time, give the mayor and commissioners your biography. Where do you work? How long have you worked there? And what do you do? I'm currently assigned to the detective division. I've been uh, a detective for coming up on six years and coming up on eight years total with the department. And you said you're you are assigned as a detective, correct? I am. 
So I want to talk to you particularly about specialty pay. We just heard from Sergeant Mathis about wages and their impact on recruiting and retention, particularly people of color and bringing them into the law enforcement community in Turpin Springs. I want to talk to you about specialty pay and particularly your work as a detective and the kind of work that you do. You said you've been with Tarpon for eight years, correct? Coming up on eight years. Got it. And in the detective unit, you all work homicides, suicides, stabbings, those kinds of things, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. You work a special area called the special victims area. Is that right? I do. And what does that mean? What does it mean to be a detective in the special victims area? Uh, so specifically, I take care of uh, anybody who has been sexually assaulted in our city. Um, that also includes uh, what we call a cap sex bat, um, which is a capital case in which a child under the age of 12 has been sexually assaulted by a vic by excuse me by a perpetrator over the age of 18. Got it. So we're saying all this quickly because again we're on a Zoom call. Um, and this is heavy stuff and I wanna make sure that we're giving it the appropriate weight because you live with that weight every day. So what is the impact of investigating child sex crimes on you? Um, so that can mean being tasked uh, with a tall order uh, at a two o'clock in the morning call out. Um, it's meeting a child in the middle of the night, uh, sometimes in a hospital bed who has maybe been raped by her father for several years. Um, it's being a perfectly good stranger to um, a six-year-old, a uh, scared little girl, um, and earning her trust after she's been through, you know, a horrific ordeal, sometimes for years. Um, you have to gain their com comfort um, and know how to properly extract a non-leading, uh, you know, very detailed, articulated statement. Um, you have to get them to tell you basically... Uh, their darkest secret, their deepest, darkest secret uh, as, a, as a perfectly good stranger. Um, knowing that child knows that you might arrest their father when you're done speaking, or they may be ripped out of their home um, because maybe mom wasn't protective over them. Uh, you have to have specialized training. Um, you have to be able to uh, know how to interview and talk to a child and operate within a very specific set of parameters um, so that you don't, in essence, make it easy to understand. So you don't blow the case before you get started. There's yep. a lot of things in child uh, interviewing that you can't do. Uh, you can't ask a, a child a closed-ended question. You can't ask them many different types of questions, but you still need them to be able to be comfortable and articulate. Um, and you need it to be able to get, you need to be able to get them to be able to tell you that they can't get daddy's white boogers that comes out of his penis off of their tongue because it is so slimy. You can't just have them tell you, he put this there. That doesn't cut it. You so have to be I want to wrap that in, detective, to the idea, and this is so hard because I'm, mo I'm moving you guys so quickly because we want to cover so much area. What does it mean to have to get up at two o'clock in the morning and do that? Because what we're asking the mayor and the vice mayor and commissioners to vote for is a specialty pay that recognizes the impact of having to wake up in the middle of the night and go talk to that little girl or having to leave your own family to go talk to that little girl. Why should the city of Turpin Springs invest 5% base pay in you for doing that? Um, it means getting up in the middle of the night on call outs. It means leaving my toddler who's on, you know, perhaps maybe on home health uh, to come and take care of somebody else's family um, or a breastfeeding infant who's, need, you know, needs milk every few hours. Um, means late night studying for depots, uh, you know, hearings, motions, trials um, after my full day's work. Uh, it means stopping bath time, bedtime, dinner, which usually is late, if at all. <laughs> Um, you know, it means uh, leaving a newborn, chasing a, a, somebody who's murdered several people in our city across the country while I'm, you know, pulling my, my pump bag in tow. Um, it means going into preterm labor with my firstborn and staying for a victim interview in which uh, we got a plea deal for 30 years. Um, it means going into labor while working, uh, you know, my, my, my second pregnancy going into uh, dealing with a baby that was five months old and disabled and his father tried to murder him. It's staying for the, for those because my family doesn't come first. The city's families comes first. 
How many capital sexual batteries would you say you investigate in Tarpon Springs a month? What's the range? Um, we investigate a multitude. Sometimes it's it's uh, different than other months. I would say maybe allegation wise, we could potentially get anywhere between five to eight a month, maybe. I mean, not, not all sustained, you know, but in addition to working those cases, you want somebody that's experienced to not only be able to make a fantastic case and to take somebody off the street and put them in prison for 30 years after they've raped a child, but it's also equally as important to be able to have that experience to have somebody come forth who's been accused of a sex crime and maybe a capital capital case against a 12 year old or, or a six year old, and maybe they're not guilty. And you have to have that experience to be able to say, this didn't happen the way that everybody thinks or the way that, that it sounds. That takes experience. And that's just every bit as important. So this 5% specialty pay, just to wrap it back around, we have so few minutes left. But the idea here is that detectives who do the kind of heavy, emotional, psychological, investigative lifting that the detectives at Tarpon Springs are doing should be recognized with a 5% specialty pay, whereas now they are recognized with a 0% specialty pay, correct? Yes. I need you in a minute or less to tell the mayor and commissioners what it would mean to you if they recognized your work with a 5% specialty pay. It would make me feel valued. Um, it makes my experience feel valued, um, respected, most of all supported. Um, it would make me feel that the city recognized that you also need to support your citizens, you know, who have a six-year-old, you know, or an eight-year-old who, who's been raped. Um, in a world where right now the country's climate is, I feel that most of the country hates me for who I am and being a police officer and the job that I do. Um, it would make me feel valued and supported because the job I do is the very same as they do next door in Tampa. Thank you, Detective. Can you send up Officer Brinker, please, for our last few moments? Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Officer Brinker. Hello. How long have you served with Tarpon Springs PD? I've been with Tarpon for four years now, a little over four years. And have you recently received any awards? Yes, I have. I've received three different awards. First was the life-saving award, a letter of accommodation, and the officer of the quarter award. Can you tell us briefly the factual circumstances that led you to receive the letter of commendation award? Yes, ma'am. So I observed a female who I later determined was a juvenile, 15-year-old female, walking down the street. She seemed like she was in distress. When I made contact with her, she I observed blood all over her arms, her legs, and she had a 12 inch blade knife holding up above her head facing towards me. I then used verbal commands for her to drop the weapon. I ended up getting her detained without any injury for myself or her. And I got her into protective custody. And you said she was 12? 15. 15. Were you previously assigned as a school resource officer? Yes. Where? What school? Tarpon Springs Elementary. And how old are the kids at that elementary school? They range from about three to 12 years old. Do you have previous experience working with kids? I do. I used to work for a child care program, which I was the manager for and VPK teacher for about eight years. And I mean, this is a silly question because otherwise you're a serious masochist, but do you enjoy working with children? I do. I love working with children. And do you think the qualities that you have that were recognized in those awards you received were relevant to your work as a school resource officer at Tarpon Elementary? I absolutely do. I learned a lot from working with the children for the years that I have, and I've learned how to speak with them on their level and how to communicate with them the best way I can. Are schools more dangerous now than they used to be? Can you repeat that question? Are schools more dangerous now than they used to be? Absolutely, with all the school shootings, absolutely. So you loved being a school resource officer and you had 10 years of VPK experience and you really like kids, right? Yes. But yes. you loved being the school resource officer at Tarpon Elementary, why? I did, I, I left there, I was actually losing pay going to the school resource officer unit. On patrol, you're getting an average of 42 hour work week. And with the school resource officer, you're only getting 40 hours a week. So therefore I'm losing pay. And being a single parent, um, I have my son all the time and it, really hurt me financially moving from that hour, 42 hours to 40 hours. 
So I think you're aware, officer, that we're asking the mayor and commissioners to decide whether to include a section in our contract that would allow the police chief to move school resource officers and other administrative positions to a 42 hour work week. If that had been in place and you had been able to work a 42 hour work week as a school resource officer, would you have stayed in that position longer? I would have definitely considered it, yes ma'am. All right, nothing further. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. All right, I see the rest of my time. Mr. Mayor, I have approximately 12 seconds left. I'm gonna stop myself. All right, um, Ms. Jackson, uh, under the procedures that the parties agreed to, you have three minutes to question any of the persons who presented for the union. Do you have anybody that you'd like to question? Mr. Fisher felt the point of order. Um, when would we have any questions of uh, Ms. Sloan? Uh, Jackson? Uh, well, as, as I said at the beginning, at any time a, a commissioner has questions, you can certainly uh, uh, ask. So if you want to go ahead and pose your question before we go to Ms. Jackson, that'd be fine. Thank you. Um, Ms. Lone, I have four questions and, and I really need some clarity on this. Um, I very much appreciate all the testimony that was given and, and it was extremely helpful with the personal experiences and everything. Um, I want to kind of focus on what the requests are for this evening. Yes, sir. Uh, one, I want to confirm that the, the city's offer was, um, and I may have to use an example, but I, I think it could explain it, 3% across the board with no strep increase. In other words, if a police officer is making X number of dollars, and let's say, let's roll this back so we're not talking about 2021, but 2019 is an example. And, um, and in 20. Uh, 20, given that that's, that's moved as a step, um, but we're not talking about that, a general wage increase. So let's say that it would be uh, X number of dollars plus 3%. Is that correct? Okay. And may I say it back to you, Commissioner, just to make sure I understand? Yes. Okay. I'm also having just a tiny, like every once in a while, there's a pause where I can't hear, like I'll miss one of the words that you say, which is why I'm repeating it back to you. I want to get it right. So the last offer from the city was a 3% general wage increase, but in order for the officers to get that 3% general wage increase, they had to agree to not move forward on their step plan. So a step 10 officer would stay a step 10 officer instead of moving to his or, his or her, excuse me, step 11. So in order to access that 3% pot, they had to stop themselves in their career progression step plan track. Okay. That, that's helpful. And I do have a question for the uh, um, our city administration in that regard at the pro at the appropriate time. Uh, number two, um, I don't know whether Detective Lemon or anyone else that gave testimony tonight, but this is really for him or maybe for yourself. If you recall, in uh, 2017, uh, there was a 5% general wage increase and along with a 2.25% step. Was there any uh, explanation of what of that of why that was the case. This is just background information that, that that's a, that's a I'm sorry, very nice adjustment, but I'm, I'm not sure I understand what the basis was for that. I'm sorry, I, Commissioner. I, Could I don't you remember repeat what that? the basis was. for. That. I'm sorry, sir. There was a technological um, challenge. I'm not sure if anyone else is hearing me. I can hear you, sir. It's just, it was like kind of doing that weird, like the, the, base, the, the, the basis for the 2017 5% general wage increase, and then also the 2.25% for the younger officers uh, step increase, the, why that was such a, a generous uh, adjustment at that time. You know, sir, I can't answer that. I will tell you that from the beginning, we asked the city for a three, three, and a three for the general wage increase in keeping with what was standard and frankly, like pretty, modest in Pinellas County. All right. Uh, number three, with regard to the detective unit, is that an assignment or is that a promotion? In other words, if it's, a, it's similar to a corporal where they're assigned um, um, uh, for some period of time and, it's, and the chief could have that uh, detective in that position revert to the regular patrol force. 
Yes, sir. That position at Turpin Springs is not a promotion and it's not an entitlement position. So it's up to the chief of police to move staff in and out of those positions as he sees fit. Okay. And how many off, how many detectives do we have or do, are we talking about? In the detective unit, the total personnel that we'd be asking for the 5% specialty pay is seven human beings, sir. Seven? Seven, sir. Seven. Okay. Um, and then also, um, the last question is, in this executive summary we received, um, it says that the last proposal from the PBA regarding the impasse issues is as follows general wage increase. The PBA demanded a 3% general wage increase plus an increase in steps for the fiscal year 2021. Yeah. And um, I don't know what that increase is. In other words, I, I understand the yes. 3%, but what is the, the, the step increase that you're asking for? This respectfully is one of the areas in the city manager's executive summary that I don't agree with. I think it's worded in a way that's confusing. So what we asked is for the members to move through their step plan just the same way they always would. If you're a step 10 officer, you move to step 11. If you're a step 11 officer, you move to step 12, et cetera. We didn't ask for anything special. We just said, please let them continue to move through their very, very long step plan and give them the 3% GWI that keeps us competitive so we can recruit and retain. Okay, so it's the same, uh schedule that I'm looking at appendix two in the contract um, where younger officers receive a 2.25% step and the more senior ones move down to a 1.75% step. Is that correct? It's the exact same step, sir, that's in the October 1st, 2017 through September 30th, 2020 contract. We're not asking for any deviation or change to that step plan that's already in place. And I do need to correct myself, Commissioner, if you'd just allow me. I misspoke. I said it was seven human beings in the detective unit. It's actually eight. It's close enough. Thanks. Uh, I like thanks. to be accurate. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Those were the questions I had. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Eschenfelder, I have a couple questions that I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Long. Okay. Uh, the uh, the step percentage for all the positions are all equal. No, sir. Know? As far as I understand it, the step the percentages between the different steps changes depending on where you are on the step plan. But that plan is a, a set piece that we're not asking for yourself and the members of the commission to change. It's not one of the issues that's in controversy. Okay. Uh, let's go to the uh, the specialty pay. Yes, sir. The uh, detectives, when they will call out to work, do they get a different uh, night differential or shift differential when they work nights? No, sir, they or do not. No, sir, they do not. So who gets the uh, night differential or the shift differential? Is it a certain people? No one, sir. At the city of Turban Springs Police Department, not a single police officer receives a shift differential. We brought that information to you to show how different it is in pay to work somewhere like the sheriff's office where they do receive that shift differential. Okay. The, um, the detectives, are they volunteers to work on that position or they were assigned to work in that position? That's probably a complicated question, sir, but I would say that there are wonderful people here who rise to the occasion and put in for those positions and then are given the opportunity to work in that division by the chief of police. That's all I have right now, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any other commissioners have any questions of Ms. Lone before we move to Ms. Jackson? I had a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Um, my first one, I just want to know, how is um, the potential specialty pay for detectives? How's that paid out? Is that like a 5% bonus you get at the end of the year? Is that 5% on top? How is that paid? Typically, sir, it's a 5% of base pay that's included in the officer's regular paycheck. So someone okay. in finance for the city would, would find out what 5% of their base pay would be and would basically prorate that out through the paychecks throughout the year. Okay. 
And then regarding the 42 hour work week, I, I just missed what was the what's the current work week? It's 40 hours. So it vacillates depending on what area of the department you work in. So, for example, right now, the department has its patrol shifts on 42 hours or there's the option to work a 42 hour shift in detective or excuse me, in these administrative positions that we brought up to you most Importantly, we highlighted the SRO, the school resource officer position. They're on a 40 hour set work week. So importantly, we're not asking, I try very much to stay in my lane and we're not asking for management to compulsory move every school resource officer to a 42 hour work week. What we're saying is we would like this contract to include a provision that says that the chief of police is empowered to put the school resource officer and those other administrative positions on a 42 hour work week. We just want the contract to be explicit that he has the power to do that if he so chooses. Okay, and what would the uh, two extra hours, what would that entail? Is that like, hey, you work two extra hours doing what you would normally do? Or is that, you know, go out on patrol for two hours? I don't, how does that work? No, sir, it would be up to the discretion of the chief of police or his designee regarding how those two hours would be utilized. I, one of the things I really, like I said, I really try to stay in my lane. Management has very specific rights on how it chooses to utilize its personnel. So the police department could use those two hours however they see fit. In the school resource officer context, as a civilian, I would probably be best to defer and say that that would be up to the chief or his designee. Okay. And then just something that, that occurred to me, um, I guess, leading up to the meeting, especially talking about specialty pay and a lot of the benefits that um, you know, other police departments might have. Are some of those other benefits beyond just specialty pay or shift differential? Are, are there any other like, you know, perks that you can think of? Like, um, I know sometimes I see like sheriff cars come home into my neighborhood and yes. then they get to take their cars home. Do we do that in Tarpon? So I will say that we don't do that across the board. It's not, it's in the sheriff's office and St. Pete Police Department and Clearwater Police Department and in almost every other law enforcement agency where I work that's not a tiny, tiny hometown, like seven man police department, they have a take home car policy. Take home cars are means that a law enforcement personnel is not required to put mileage on his or her car. And the gasoline that fills up that car is paid for by the city. That's a huge I will tell you as a person who used to have a take home car when I worked for a police department, it is a huge bottom line saver to drive someone else's car and put someone else's gas in that car. Okay, those are all my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I, just, I have a couple questions as well. If you, um, you could just clarify something for me. Yes, sir. Um, so the 40 hour work week, work week for the administrative type roles and SROs they're not prevented from working overtime, right? Correct. They're not prevented from working overtime if overtime is available, but it's not something, you know, it would be a foolish police officer to make a budget based on overtime. Right, but overtime's available though, right? Yes, sir, overtime is available if it, if it is, right? Like if a situation manifests where it's needed. Okay. Um, and then I, I'm still trying to understand the step plan and like the, the, um, the wage increases Mm -hmm. So let's say we have an officer that's at step 20 mm -hmm. um, and I see for 2020 it's proposed or we'll use 2021 it's proposed at 76,326. So if there's a 3% wage increase as well, does the 76,000 increase by 3% then? So in order to calculate, I get it. I had trouble with this when I first started too. So there's basically two categories that we're asking you to think about. Let's start with this category, which is the step plan. The step plan means that if I'm on step one of the plan and then I stay here for a year, I move to step two of the plan. And then I move to step three of the plan based on just years of service. On this hand is the general wage increase. That and what we're asking for is a 3% general wage increase. It's based off of your step in the step plan. So if I'm making, let's say I, I work for the most expensive police department in the whole world and I make $100,000 a year, right? My 3% would be $3,000, right? So then I would be making $103,000 a year. Obviously we're not, I'm just using round numbers because like Detective I Lemon, I'm a lawyer, not a mathematician. I understand. Um, so that ultimately increases the step then for the previous year or the next years, right? No, sir, it doesn't increase the step. So we're not looking to change the, yeah, you're doing complicated math, we're not. The step plan is just a set piece. Imagine it like a bridge or like a ladder. So just because Detective Lemon, basically if, if 
a detective is on step two and they get their 3%, a detective on step one gets their 3%. It doesn't change the pay scale. It doesn't change the floor or the ceiling. I'm not making sense. No, because it just means that after 2020, it's a, it's an increase goes in this year of 3%. Then at the end of this year, that 3% goes away and you're still on that step plan. Is that yes, correct? Yes, you're right. That's correct. There are two separate pieces that work in concert if they're working right. The step plan is just like a ladder. It stays the same. And the GWI is the only thing besides, it's the only thing that makes those steps add like a cost of living increase. So, okay, going back to my example of $76,000, let's say for 2021. Yep. It's, it's a 3% increase and we'll just save rough numbers. It's $2,500. Yep. Um, and then 2022 comes along and the step plan goes up to $77,000. Mm-hmm but you still have that 3% from the previous year, correct? Correct. But that's why, that's why these contracts are done year or three years at a time. So if you're a police officer and you're trying to figure out your budget and you look at the contract, what you're doing is you're looking and saying, okay, I'm at the, I'm at step. What is $76,000 a year? Vice mayor, what step is that? It's step 20 year two, 2021. Step 20. Yeah. So at step 20, you'd be at the top of the pay scale. So you wouldn't move up to another step because that's maximum. So all you're getting is your 3% general wage increase. So, and help me just understand this and Mr. Lemons or uh, Sergeant Terrain Mathis can maybe answer this. When I'm looking at the PowerPoint, it says step 20, then it has years 20, 21, 22, and 23. And then 75, 76, 77, 78,000. So, although we're at step 20, or maybe does that start at year 16, maybe? Uh, I don't know. Um, You're looking at what PowerPoint, sir? Uh, the PowerPoint you presented tonight. Okay. And you, can you tell me what, what page you're looking at so I can look at it too? Uh, it's basically the, all of them, but it's the, Pinell, it's the one that you compare the, the plans to each other Pinellas County versus Carpenter Springs. Got it. I'm a visual learner, so it helps me to look at what you're looking at. All right. So you're at, you're looking at proposed Tarpon Springs PD step 20 for 2021, which is 76, 3, 26, 21. Right. So if an officer had been with the city of Tarpon Springs in the contract that we're asking you for, and he had topped out at step 20, meaning he's, he's now at the top of the ladder. He can't go, there is no step 21. So if he's at step 20, and he's making $76,326.21, all this contract would give him is the 3% general wage increase. Okay. Does that make sense? I don't sense? know. No, I understand uh, what you're saying. I just don't know why there's four different, there's a different year, each year oh, to escalate. So God I don't know if that's just- Okay, I understand now. When we- Year 16 this, through 20? When we built this PowerPoint, sir, we built it for the city and we presented it to them during contract negotiations to try to show how different their offer, how basically how badly their offer was going to impact the pay differential between Tarpon Springs PD and, for example, the sheriff's office or the other agencies. So the reason those numbers are there are to show like for 2021, we were showing that if they only gave them the 1.25%, that's the that's the wage that that officer would receive. Okay. We built it out for 2021, 22, and 23. Okay. So I, I'm still trying to, to mill this 3% wage increase and how it affects the step plan. So I'm going to go ahead and pause my questions for now and kind of wait for this, um, the city side. Um, but obviously, thank you for your time with this. And uh, thank you for all the, all the staff that's here with us tonight too. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Ms. Jackson, do you have any questions of Ms. Lone for three minutes? No, I do not. Okay, you wanna move into your 45 minutes? Yes, thank you. And I'd like the uh, Chief Cochin, please. Um, we'll be answering questions first. I'm sorry, uh, let me, if, do you hear a noise? Um, Behind me, they're they're vacuuming, and I can ask them to stop. Yeah, it sounds like they're vacuuming in the back. We can yeah, see I'm them. I'm so sorry. That just started. Yeah, we can see them. We're on. I apologize.
I appreciate that. Sorry, that was less than ideal timing. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Chief, how long have you been with the city of Tarpon Springs? Oh, uh, first of all, good evening, Ms. Jackson and Mayor and Board of Commissions. Um, I've been with the city for 31 years. And how long have you been a police officer? 32 years. How so with, with that, with that, I have 20. I have 21 years of command level experience of that 10 years as uh, chief of police. And chief of police with the city or, or was that elsewhere? What's she asking? Elsewhere. Yeah, I, I did a stint with Clearwater Police Department before I came to Tarpon Springs back in 87, 88. And then I, Sorry, go ahead. No, nope, and I started in Tarpon Springs in February, February 11th of 1989. How many officers do you have in the department? Total of 53 sworn. And how do you feel about those officers, Chief? How do you feel? Yeah, how we feel about them, they're awesome. I mean, they're TSPD's finest. We work with them all the time. I think um, we have a very good culture at the police department. Um, I love working with these officers. Um, some of the um, more senior officers I've, I've come up through the ranks with and personally know them and even even the younger officers, you know, we you know, we get to know them really well. And, and it's really, you know, I look at all of us as a family and, and it's, it's just a, a really good team effort here. And um, I'm honored to, to serve with the men and women of the Tarpon Springs Police Department. Were you part of the negotiation team for this? Yes, department? I was. Yes, I was. Have you been part of the negotiation team from the past? Yes, yeah, starting with um, the 2008-2011 contract, 2011 to 2014 contract, 2014 to 2017 contract, and then the 217, uh, 2017 contract to the 2020 contract, and then, of course the current one that we're negotiating for. Can you share with the commission the history of the, the contract negotiations, uh, particularly starting with the 2014 contract and the, um, the negotiations around wages and, and what the city offered and, and what was ultimately agreed upon? Yes. Um, first of all, real quick, the 28 to 2011 and 2011 to 2014 contracts were obviously done during the Great Recession. Those were difficult times. Everybody was in the same boat. But in the 2014 contract um, to 2017, the city really stepped up to compete with the Sheriff's Department. At that time, the Sheriff's Department kicked in a step plan, which our step plan is basically mirrored after, although there is there's top out at, at 17, we top out at 20. But um, in that year, the first year of the plan, the average raise was close to 7% for all officers. Year two, 5%, year three, a little over 3%. Um, that contract really kind of got us in the game with pay and the sheriff's department. Um, so it was, a, it was a really good contract for the officers that year and I'm, I'm glad we could do it for them. And then, um, the 2017 to 2020 contract, and I know uh, Commissioner Vaticalis had a question about year one. So we did a three-year contract, obviously, and in year one, we front-end loaded the contract. So we gave them a 5% raise plus their step increase. So in other words, and I'm going to share that um, with the board, Aaron, when you, when you uh, ask me to, but I'll talk about the, uh, the pay matrix, if you will, and the step plan. Um, year one through 10 is a 2.25% step plan raise. So it's basically loaded in the first 10 years to kind of get officers pay going up quicker as they progress through the 20 years. And then it starts to flatten out right around year 12 at 1.75% all the way through year 20. The sergeants have a 10 year step plan and their step increases are evenly spread out at 1.75% from year one all the way through 10. So in the last contract, again, the first year was front end loaded with a 5% um, GWI, what everyone has been talking about tonight, that's just a general wage increase. Basically that moves the annual pay and the hourly pay through all ranges equally, so you don't have compression. So in year one, in, in the current contract, if you were looking at a 5% and you were first year officer, you were really looking at a 7.25% total wage. If you were more on the top end, you were looking at a 6.75 total uh, wage increase. And that's with everything, with the GWI and the step increases as they move through the step plan. Um, so I hope I address that um, for you. Thank you, Chief. And if you would, would you go ahead and share uh, what you were mentioning earlier in terms of the, the step increases and the 5% and, and the, um, okay. the numbers themselves? 
Okay, well, uh, we're going to go to Sheen's uh, screen share real quick. Okay. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, so this is this is what's called Appendix 2, and, and this step plan is actually contractual. So it goes in line with, with, our, with our union contracts with the PBA. So when you look at Appendix 2, you see police officer. I'll just go through the columns from left to right. You see police officer years of service, step 1 through 20, and then sergeant years of service, step 1 through 10. And then, of course, on the right of that is the base salary um, in an hourly wage. And then the next one is the annual salary. Again, I'm going from left to right in the columns. And then what you see in the middle, the 1%, now this is the final year of, of this current contract that we were in. That's what you would commonly refer to as the GWI. That would be, that would be if a GWI was 3%, all of those wages would move 3% all the way across the step plan. That would be the first thing. All of the wages move 3%. Um, and then the, the next column is what the officer's salary would be at 2080 hours. And, and the reason we did this, because you're going to look on the far right, and it's 2184 hours, which would be the 12-hour shifts, because patrol works 12-hour shifts, and then all those on... Uh, administrative assignments are working a normal 40 hour week, which is uh, 2,080 hours annually. So you can see the difference in pay. Obviously, if you're on a 12 hour shift, you're working 2,184 as opposed to 2,080. So sandwiched between those two columns are the step increases. So what you see again is when you look at entry one at 2.25% step, for them to go into two, they would get a 2.25% step raise. And if the GWI kicked in, that range would move up an additional 3%, or if it was a 2%, an additional 2%. So the steps are a means, uh, and they're fixed in the contract. They're a means to, to move yourself up through the step plan, ultimately topping out for an officer at 20 years, and for a sergeant, ultimately topping out at 10 years. So. The good thing about a step plan, and, and again, we, we did this in line to compete with the sheriff's office because the sheriff's office was one of the agencies that really, back in the day, tended to take personnel away from us. But um, we mirrored this right after their step plan. So I like step plans because there's no compression, the steps are clearly defined, and then the GWI is obviously negotiated, and in theory, so are the steps. But um, so everything is structured appropriately. So these officers and the sergeants, they move through their step plan in a systematic uh, manner and, and a very defined manner. So I hope I, um, I know it's easier for the commissioners to look at this. So maybe they get a better grasp of, of how it works. But um, I hope I've answered your questions. I hope I provide some clarity to, you know, the overall step plan and how it works. Keith, let's leave that on a second. I want to ask you a question concerning that. Um, yes, the, sir. The city's office, the, if, uh, Mr. Schenfelder, I'm going to jump right in here. Um, the city's offer for this, uh, this negotiation was 3%. Is that correct? With a freeze, uh, incre with a freeze on the uh, step increase. Yeah, our best and final was a 3% GWI, general wage increase. So that means that all the officers would have stayed in the step and all of those ranges would adjust 3%. So everybody, um, to include all the officers and the sergeant, would get a 3% raise on their salary. Okay. And, so and if you don't mind, that was our best and final because we originally offered a 1.25% GWI and then their step increases, which on, and, and the PBA was not, or the Suncoast PBA was not very warm to that. But under our initial offer, 90% of all of our officers we're getting anywhere from a 3% to a 3.5% raise, depending on where you were in the steps. And then the ones that were topped out in either step 20 or step 10, you know, we've gotten only a 1.25% raise. So then we came back um, after the PBA you know, was really warm to that. We came back and just said, look, for the first year, we can give you a 3% GWI. Everybody gets a 3% raise. Unfortunately, people do stay frozen in their steps, but then we offered in year two and three, and, and we really wanted to close the gap. Um, we wanted to get a better idea of, of what the financial picture looked like for the city, but in year two and three, our intention was to come back 
and make adjustments to, you know, to be competitive and fix some of those gaps that the PBA had talked about. Um, the question I had was using this uh, uh, wage scale that you show there, um, let's say at uh, entry level years of service two, as an example, um, you go from fiscal year 19 to fiscal year 20, you get a 1% general wage increase plus a step of 2.25%. So that would be a 3.25% salary increase. Is that correct? That is correct, Commissioner. So that would be for uh, all the officers that we've got from entry level, um, actually from the entry level up to about um, it, uh, entry level 10, I'm sorry. Um, Step 10. But the, uh, right, the uh, years of service 10. So in effect, we're just so I get it straight, we're asking some officers to make you know, as far as to their uh, salary adjustment would be actually less is what the city is being offered or is offering as compared to what they had last year. So we offered less? Only a 3%. Yeah, on that, well, yes, for, yes, for, for some, the 3% general wage increase that was our best and final would be less than they would have gotten with a normal 1.25% GWI and their step. That is correct. Right. So, how many officers do we have um, from the uh, um, years of service 10? How many in step 10? Well, up from, 10. from the earliest at the entry level all the way up to 10. About 25. Okay, so, about half the force, I would assume? Correct, half the bargaining unit. So I, I, all right, so that we would be offering them less there. All right, um, and uh, after step 20, um, I'm sorry, yes, yeah, step 20, which would be years of service 20, we've got a defined pension plan. Um, when would be the earliest that police officers could retire from the city? 25 and out. So on our, on our pension plan, we have 25 and out at, um, you know, whatever the multiplier was, so you have your multiplier and then your average final compensation on the pension plan. Um, and then we have an early retirement with 10 years vesting at age 50. Okay, so basically from uh, years of service 20 through 25, they would not get a uh, step increase. It would just be the general wage increase. Wage increase. That's right. No, they would get a step increase. Well, they would, yeah, they would, if they're topped out, they would get, you're, you're absolutely right, the GWI, if they were topped out. And how many officers do we have that are over 20 years right now? Right now we have um, four officers that are in step 20 and two sergeants that are in step 10. So those officers and sergeants would be would be topped out. Okay. And then lastly, um, what is our attrition rate for the uh, uh, police department? Let's say in the last couple of years, what, what's it been running? I would say with the exception of retirements, turnover is very low, um, but we are getting into like, like everywhere else in the country, we are getting into an era where a bunch of retirements are coming up and we've already had several. We don't really know what the attrition rate is. You don't monitor that or? We don't have a number. Yeah, we don't have a percentage. I mean, we know, we know when people, especially as slated to retire, um, we don't know when people may decide to leave to go to another agency. Usually that's just a, a two week notice and you know, but I don't, I don't have all those percentages, but it's been very low. Okay. I, I, I all right. Just, I, I mean, I, I don't understand that because I asked the same question of the, uh, uh, of the general employees and I had to wait about two weeks to get that number. And I keep hearing about how competitive we are in our salaries and things and, and that, uh, you know, we, we don't have a problem with a attrition, but people don't seem to know what the attrition rate is. So I, I'm a little surprised in that. Um, what, what's the training cost for an officer, a young officer at the, at the Tarpon Springs Police Department? I would estimate about 30,000 a year. 30,000. So there is some. Oh, 30,000 to train. That's with everything. FTO pay, overtime, equipment, outfitting, roughly 30,000. To get them started as a patrolman. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So there is some actually incumbency on our part to incentivize the process for police officers to uh, to stay rather than uh, being trained, for example, staying here another year or two and moving on to another. Uh, 
Is that a Absolutely. All right, Chief. Thank you. Ms. Jackson, I don't have any other fur further questions at this point. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Essenfelder? Yes. This is uh, Jacob Carr. Um, I think we waited as a board to ask uh, the PBA questions until the end of the presentation. Is the city going to get the time back that Commissioner Vatikiotis used for questioning for their presentation? Well, I had pressed stop on my timer, but I know the clerk is keeping the official time, so, so she'd have to verify that she's pressing stop on hers. I just want to validate that. I think it's fair for both I sides. Did I did pause it. Okay. okay. All right. Thank so, you. So they're going to get their time. All right. Thanks. Um, I have some questions that I'd like to ask the chief. Yes, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, how comparable we are with the salaries and benefits with the uh, other cities similar to our size in population? Well, I think it's true that we're falling behind. Um, I think the PBA did a survey, we did a survey, and, and it's showing that we're starting to fall behind. There's a myriad of reasons for that. And in our initial negotiations, that's why in year two, two and three, a lot of, uh, we put a lot of things for discussion in those years, like the wage reopeners and talking about all the, you know, all the proposals that the union made to discuss them in year two and three, when the city can get a better idea of where we were financially. Thank you. The uh, pension plan that we have for our uh, police officers, is that a percentage of their salary and how does it work? Because if we have a freeze on the staffs, is that going to hurt them with their uh, pension plan? Well, it's all it's based on the way the pension plan works is you have what's called the 3% multiplier. So for every year of service, they get 3%. So if you retire 25 years, you get 75% of what they call your average final compensation. And that's your best five years out of the last 10 averaged. And then there's a calculation done by the actuary in our finance department. And then you get what your annual compensation would be on the pension plan upon retirement. So is so they're going to have an effect, right? Yes. Anytime, anytime someone's not getting a raise, you know, especially when you're looking at your best five years out of your last ten, if you're not getting a raise, it could have an impact on your final numbers on the pension. Yes. Well, also be Thank you. Posthumous. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Chief, can you walk us through the negotiations? Yes, Aaron. So we had um, a total of six uh, collective bargaining sessions with the Suncoast PBA. Um, and, you know, we basically for the first two sessions listened to um, pretty much everything that the, the PBA thought that, that we should look at and, and provide for their membership. And, and they've been talking about, obviously, some of those things in their presentation, such as the detective 5% specialty pay, um, again, the pay increases that, that we had talked about, um, the SRO hours that, that they had talked about. And, and there are some other things that were on the table, but really maybe not be a part of this meeting. I don't know if you want me to go through all of those because we're only really talking about three things. So we're really limited in our time. So if you could just address the three things, that would be excellent. Okay, so um, so we went through a series of, of these collective bargaining sessions, both parties in good faith, obviously, um, going especially back and forth on, on the wages. Um, you know, again, um, I think the first PBA um, presentation was a three, three and three plus the steps. Um, and then, you know, we, we kind of countered with a 1.25 plus the steps with wage reopeners in year two and three. Um, they kind of countered with a 3% GWI plus the steps in year one, and they agree with us on year two and three with the reopeners. Um, and then, you know, we, again, we gave our best and final um, with the 3%, basically 3% in year one, that's just a GWI, no step movement. And then in year two and three was the 1.25% GWI plus their steps, and then the wage reopeners for both year two and three. And that's where we kind of got stuck. Why? Why was that our final offer? We had we had direction to try and work with three percent. The city was 
The city was, you know, really struggling to balance the budget. The city administration come in with a balanced budget. So the commission wasn't forced to, to dip into reserves. Um, our direction was to try and stay within 3%. And you can only make that 3% work so many ways. So when, when, the, when the Suncoast PBA, and, and I can't speak for them, but I felt personally that they really didn't like the fact that some of the senior officers, you know, in our first proposal, we've only gotten a 1.25%, the ones being topped out. So we, we came back in good faith and said, you know, maybe the Suncoast PBA would like if we just give everybody a 3% across the board so everyone's getting an equal raise, we freeze the steps for year one and then again come back in year two and three with the 1.5% GWI plus their steps plus wage reopeners for both years. And how about the specialty pay? What was the concern there? We, um, our, our, our detectives, I mean, they're a phenomenal unit. They work hard. They're on call all the time. Um, they do get overtime pay. They do have take home cars. So they, they've gotten, they've got benefits on top of what they make. Um, I do realize, you know, that other agencies very commonplace for them to have specialized pay for their detectives. So again, we wanted to regroup in year two and really look at that to see if we could financially do it for the detectives. So, it, it, you know, again, it, it is in line with what most everybody else is doing in the county. But it, again, it came down to we're looking at 3%. The city's trying to present a balanced budget without dipping into reserves. And, you know, you can only really work with that 3% so many ways. And then with respect to the 42-hour work week for the SROs and others? Yeah, the SROs now, I, I, I'm going to talk as a police chief. Um, the SROs work a 40 hour work week. They have take home cars and they get overtime for anything above and beyond 40 hours. They are on a 2080 annual work schedule. My problem with that as chief is really the only way I could do it is if we put them on a 42 hour work week, I'm just going to pay them a half hour extra a day to stay at the school. And I, I don't really know if that's conducive to the overall operations of the police department. I'm basically just giving them a, a half hour to just stay there. Um, I, you know, for us, I, I don't know. I think from a management perspective that, you know, I don't know if that's conducive to the operation of the police department. They work in line with the schedule of the school. Anything above and beyond that is overtime. If they have to work a game on, they deserve it. I mean, if they have to work a game on the weekend, they get overtime. If for some reason they have to stay over, they get overtime. And they're all given take home cars because of the nature of their assignment. So, um, you know, that that's our position on the 42 hour work week for Yes, or O's, but you know, I'm always open to, you know, keeping an open mind about it and, you know, and, and looking at anything. And Chief, I, you know, the, the clock is ticking, so I will need to, to call Mr. Herring to discuss the ins and outs of the financials, but is there anything else that you feel you'd like to share with the commission about the negotiations or about the union's position here? Well, I mean, I think, I think, you know, we have a very good relationship with the Suncoast PBA. I think negotiations were done very professionally and respectfully. You know, we love our officers here. They, they do a great job. Um, you know, we have provided really good contracts in the past that we talked about to include the step plan and take home cars and overtime and pension. There's a lot of other benefits um, that the officers get, but we, we want to see them competitive with everybody else. And again, that was our that was our plan in year two and three to try and close that gap. That was important for us to try and close that gap to see if we could, you know, make up some of those differences. Thank you so much, Chief. Ms. Jackson, before Chief uh, Cochin goes off, I do have Good for a second, Chief. Good for a second. Um, okay, I'm getting a question. Uh, uh, Chief Cochin, um, we front loaded 2017. I understand that. Why, why didn't we offer to do that this time? All came down to the money. Yes, uh -huh. the, we've, you front loaded the 7% plus two point, I, I'm sorry, the step increases in 2017 of a three-year contract. I'm not talking about the one-year contract, but it, it, when we first started out the negotiations, why didn't we do that this time? Is it just because of the uh, requirement of staying at 3% this year? That, that's correct, Commissioner. Okay. I, again, I, we only had, th our direction was to work with 3%. Okay, and then the 42 hour work week for the SRO, uh, based on Ms. Lone's presentation, and maybe I misunderstood her, I thought this was at your discretion. What is it? Yeah, so we're a, little, we're a little confused on that, to be honest with you. Um, we thought it was more of a, a demand, um, looking here in some of the, some of the backup, but um, I absolutely have no problem with language being put in the contracts as it, it's, you know, it's an Article 4 management right. 
um, you know, to decide what's the proper scheduling. Uh, Article 4 basically lays out management rights in our contract. But, I mean, I have no problem with that, that it's a management right to basically decide what's the appropriate scheduling for the SROs, whether they be on 2080 or 2184 annual work hours. But that would be up to you. And I think that's some point we need to get straightened out before we go into executive session, if we can, Mr. Ischenfelder. I, I agree. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Uh, Chief, uh, just for clarification purposes, would you please tell me the uh, SRO, how many hours do they actually work in school? Um, they're on a 40 hour work week. So they're, they're in sync with the school hours of the mm -hmm. school day, you know, so whatever the school's out, school hours are, that's what they work. Whether I know elementary and they're before and after. Yeah, before and after. Um, I would say they're pretty much working a 40 hour week. Now there is some overtime involved, obviously, if they make an, an arrest or if they have to stay late for a school function or if they have to come in for a game at night or work a weekend. So again, anything beyond that 40 hours for them would be overtime. Okay. The uh, reimbursement that we get from the county, is that based on the 40 hours? That, um, yeah, yes. That, well, that is, I don't think that's going to change. That's, that's just based on, you know, it, it covers about 70% of their salary and they're based on, Jeff, do you have the contract there? I don't have the contract uh, for that, but we get about $30,706 a month yeah. for the six SROs. We're getting about, we're getting about $30,000 a month from the school board for our SRO program, which, of which there are six. So I don't know how much that, you know, if they ever went to a 12 hour shift, I don't know how much the school board's going to change that contract, to be honest with you. Thank you. Mr. Nishafel, I'm finished. Thank you, Mayor. Ms. Uh, Jackson, before you. Uh, before Mr. You go, oh. This is Jacob. If I, since I, since we're asking chief questions, can I go ahead and ask them too? Sure. Um, so is, when overtime is paid, is that a higher rate than the hourly rate, chief? Yes, Vice Mayor, it's time and a half per contract. Okay. okay. Um, so if they're working 42 hours on a 40-hour week, they're making more money than they would on a 42-hour week, right? Yeah, so it, it breaks down to if you're working a 40-hour week, you're actually working 2,080 hours a year. If you're working a 42-hour week, it's 2,184 hours a year. So they're, they're, they're working more hours on the 42-hour week, obviously. Okay. So how is overtime allotted? Is it just you put it out to say we need overtime for these events or is it mandatory? Does it go to SROs? Does it go to patrols? Does it go to detectives? All the same. Um, is it a raffle? How do we, how does that happen? Um, so a lot of times with the SROs, we'll know when events are coming up. So Major Young, who oversees the SRO program, will put out, you know, basically assignment sheet signing up, usually the football games or any other school functions. So those things are really allocated to the SROs first, but a lot of times um, we won't have enough personnel to cover them. So then patrol or detectives would be offered the overtime to work those events. So the ones we know about in advance are usually posted and worked out. I mean, obviously there is overtime if something happens at the school and they have to stay late or some unforeseen event, um, then they would just get that overtime for whatever hours they work uh, over the 40 hours that week. Okay. And then just for clarification, so I understand like if uh, there's a SWAT instance, um, and you're called into duty, let's say you're on duty and there's a SWAT issue and you're on the SWAT team, um, you're paid the same, but if you're off duty that day and you're called in, then that would be overtime, correct? That's correct. It would be time and a half. And then like if we have someone on honor guard um, and honor guard goes to the lightning game to do the honor guard, is that overtime pay then at that point too? Most likely it would be overtime. You know, sometimes we could grab someone off the shift. It just depends, but most likely that's going to be an overtime event going okay. to Tampa, you know, do the lightning game. And then when the detectives are called in as well in the middle of the night or even after hours, um, that's overtime as well. Vast majority of all that will be overtime. Yes. Okay. Okay. But then like they take phone calls all, all times in the evening from different officers. That's not considered overtime then. Right. It just depends how long they have to stay on the phone call. You know, there, okay. there, are, there are Fair Labor Standards Act requirements that we have to follow. And, you know, and that's usually worked out, you know, through their sergeant and then up the chain of command. Okay. All right, Chief. Thank you. Ms. Jackson, since several commissioners had the question, and I'm not entirely sure when Ms. Lone made her presentation that it was um, 
obvious. Can you speak to the issue three? Why, what was the union's uh, reason or the underlying, uh, I guess, facts or whatnot, why they wanted it specifically confirmed in the contract that the chief had the authority, but, but the, the staff had no right to go to 42 hours on any particular uh, specialty shift? Like what, what was the, the reasoning for that? Um, well, Mr. Eschenfelder, I was not part of the negotiation team. I think that the chief would probably be the best person to answer that question for All right. he seemed confused. Backup. Yeah, he seemed confused about the ask even tonight. So, Chief, yes. can you speak to that? You know, again, um, we're seeing some different things. So I, I have no problem because we're talking about a management right under Article 4 to basically give us the discretion whether or not we want to assign uh, our SROs to a 40 hour work week. That would be totally up to us to decide whether or not we wanted to do it. So I, I don't think the city would have any issue with putting that in a management right article or the appropriate article in the union contract. Again, it's our right to decide if or not we want to do it and the union has no recourse over that. But don't you already have that right as the, the, the no. agreement is already written? You can assign people to work 42 hours as long as you pay them their overtime. No, um, that would be that would be a bargaining issue. Um, Ms. Jackson can definitely weigh out. It would be impact bargaining. So anyone, you know, anyone basically, uh, the SROs are a 40 hour work week. The only ones on the 12 hour shifts are patrol officers. So if we wanted, like we're doing now, if we wanted to put anyone else on 12 hour shifts, that would be impact bargaining. It would have to be negotiated. It would have to be agreed to. Aaron, if you could weigh in on that. Um, so I it sounds like that was the issue that it would be switching to a 12 hour shift as opposed to a 10 hour shift, an automatic 12 hour shift beyond just a, a typical 40 hour work week with overtime in the event that they have to work the overtime. It's more of a mandatory 42 hour work week. Yeah, I wouldn't call so it a 12 change, hour shift. I would call it a 42 hour work week. The change to the hour, the required number of hours per week. Okay, so then, Chief, what you're saying is that you have no objection to the union's request? If it's a management right and, and we have the sole discretion to assign those officers, whether it's 40 or 42, I have no objection to that. All right, well, it sounds like we're now are down to two issues. Ms. Jackson? <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> so it sounds like to me as well. Okay, great. Okay. Anything else for the Chief? Okay, I would now like to ask Mr. Herring to make a presentation to the commission. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners, Ron Herring, Finance Director. I, I have a brief presentation tonight to go over the effects of COVID as had on the city's revenues and expenditures for fiscal year 2020 and the fiscal year 2021 budget. And if you give me a second, I'll share my screen. I'd say I got a brief presentation here. Can you see my screen there? Yes. Okay, great. That is the, the Zoom has been a challenging for everybody, especially me, especially somebody who's not that computer tech savvy and stuff. But on this first slide, we are comparing the sales tax revenues monthly receipts for May through September 2020 to the previous year's receipts for May through September 2019. You know, we thought this was a good barometer over the months. We've been getting out this report monthly to the commissioners just to tell them, you know, you know how much sales tax revenue has been going down. You know, the, the city started seeing the sales tax revenues decline with the receipts in May 2020. And as can be seen by this chart highlighted in yellow, the city is down approximately 297,000 in revenues for fiscal year 2020 and comparing them to the previous year. Now we had, we had some other effects on the revenues. There were some other effects due to closures of activities, recreation, performing arts and a golf course. Interest earnings also went down dramatically. Before pandemic, we, our rate of turn was well over 2%. Currently we're averaging a little over 1%. And I'm, as, as investments mature, I'm seeing them going down to about 50 basis points. Um, their other loss in revenues was due to the emergency order, waiving penalties and turn on fees. And as can be seen on the slide highlighted in yellow, there's a total loss of revenues of $611,000. Uh, 
just to keep in mind that the city during this time did not furlough any employees or institute a hiring freeze. Everyone has received their full salary. Now to go to expenditures on this slide and the expenses affected the pandemic as can be seen on this slide, the cost of equipment, supplies and staff necessary come to about 300, 377,000, which is highlighted in yellow there. But this amount does not include, uh, it's not grant funded. You know, a couple other important items to mention, you know, it's important that along the road of trying to balance a budget for fiscal year 2021, especially with the effects of COVID-19, you know, as I say, it was a long road in trying to balance the budget. The budget for fiscal 2021 was submitted with a projecting a 15% decline in sales tax revenues. Now that's for the fiscal year 2021. The first proposed budget submitted back in May did not even include funding for raises, but the final approved budget included 3% funding for pay increases for all employees. And we did this by cutting expenses, but again, no, but no positions were being frozen or cut. You know, so it was a tough time in balancing the budget for fiscal year 2021, one of the most challenging times. I kept, you know, beginning when we had budget advisory committee, I kept referring back to the great recession of 2008, 2009, with, you know, with the revenue declines is what we were seeing. It, it, but it wasn't just, you know, hard on myself trying to balance the budget for the whole city, you know, for all the departments, for the city manager, for the board of commissions, you know, there was a, there was a, buff, a bunch of tough choices to make in making cuts. And as, as Ms. Jackson said, another important issue was the unassigned fund balance. The city has unassigned fund balance that is critical, as she said, for emergency situation and economic downturns. You know, maintaining adequate reserves is critical and takes discipline in strategic decision making. You know, one hurricane that directly hits Tarpon Springs could wipe out all the unassigned fund balance as evidenced, evidenced by the cities to our south that were hit by Hurricane Charlie which was, you know, I hate to say it was originally hit directly for Tarpon Springs it took a, until it took a slight turn to the east. But like I say, a lot of these cities down there, like, they lost all their, um, all their fund balance and still trying to recoup that. Um, my last slide here is going over. The last slide is trying to show that funding for the salary increases at 3% plus benefits because it costs 120721 Now that's what's funded in the budget at 3% for the police officers, $120,000 currently in the fiscal year 2021 budget. Below that is additional costs of union proposals. Above the 3% to the 4.81%, the 1.81% increase would cost $73,663. So for a total increase of $194,384 for, for the total 4.81% increase plus benefits. For some of the other items, a total of 10 new positions going to 42 hours a week. There are six school resource officers and that would cost $22,247, which includes benefits. And then there's four other positions going to 42 hours a week, two admin sergeants, a logistics, community policing, those four positions total cost would benefit benefits would be $19,464. And then the, the, the detective 5% assignment pay for eight detectives, there would be a total cost of $32,348 with benefits. So a total of those costs for additional per unit proposals are in the amount of $147,722. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Herring, I have a question to ask you. Yes. Um, those numbers that you gave us, the uh, the uh, revenue decline, which is approximately nine hundred and eight thousand dollars. Correct. And, uh, all that is affecting the uh, the general fund because the pay that uh, uh, the uh, the salaries for the employees comes from the general fund. Is that relating to the general fund? Yes, the, the salaries for the police officers comes out of the pen, out of the general fund. Okay, so the uh, nine hundred and eight thousand dollars is that relating to the general fund or other funds as well? No, the penny sales tax and the gas tax they have their own separate funds, but the rest of them are coming out of the general fund. Okay, out of the uh, nine hundred and eight thousand dollars, do we know how much that affects in the general fund? Yeah, so you mean you. 
you know, you'd have to take, it was about, if I, add, I think I added that number up, it was like $636,000, I believe. Okay. Between all these. So I got thank you. Sure. Uh, Mayor, I'm sorry, Mr. Eschenfelder, I have some questions for Mr. Herring. Okay. Uh, just to follow up, uh, Mr. Herring, um, that 636,000 uh, out of the general fund, that decline that you're mentioning, that's already taken into account in the budget. Is that correct? Well, this, this, what you're looking at here is the current year financials. What we also did was project into the, into the fiscal year 2021, a 15% decline in the sales tax revenues. So what you're looking at here is the, what, what would be now the previous year, fiscal year 2020. Where, where did you get the 15%? Is that something we discussed during the budget workshops? I don't recall that. Um, yes, it was discussed. It, it started back with budget advisory going through all the budget workshops. And um, okay, so basically what you're projecting at that time was the 15% um, decline that's not built into our current budget. You're talking about next, the fiscal year 22 budget? No, the fiscal year 2021, the one we are now currently in, we're well, we're 12 days into it right now. If that's what I'm, that's my point. It's a balanced budget at this point. Is that correct? Correct. With the reduction in the revenues. Right. So basically what that, that, that's exactly my point. So we're not looking at some kind of a, a, a another emergency $630,000 less over what our budget had been approved for. Correct. Okay. So I wanted to make sure that that was clear. Um, as far as the, um, which I think it was a very good pre presentation because I was looking for those numbers, the difference between the uh, city's final offer and that of the uh, PBA's uh, last offer, um, was that 120K versus 147,000 or was it 120K for the city and then it would be 120,000 plus 140,000 47,000 for the PBA. So it would be something like 267,000 for the PBA. Are you talking, do you see this last slide here? Are you seeing this, this last slide? Yes, I'm, I'm looking at that 120,000. Then you say in the title, additional cost of the union proposal. So would you take those two numbers and, and add them? Yep. So they would be the total cost of the PBA would be 280,000. And uh, versus the 120 that, that the city's proposal showed, the, the city's final. Correct. Okay. Um, all right. And then the um, COVID expenditures that you showed of 377,000, um, maybe I misunderstood. They're not reimbursable under the emergency order? Well, I want to make sure you know this is separate from the grant the police officers have, the $112,000 grant. Well, so, I understand that, but I, I thought all along there was some pot of money or expenses that we could actually get and reimburse through the uh, uh, through the emergency order. We just needed to keep a tally of it. And at some point, we're going to submit it for a reimbursement. Correct. We are submitting for the three hundred seventy-seven thousand. Um, we are not sure if we're going to get all that because some of it's regular wages, and a lot of times FEMA will not pay for regular wages. They'll pay for overtime, but they won't pay for regular wages. All right. Just, just a, a silly question. How is this three hundred seventy-seven thousand one hundred eighty-one dollars related to the police department cost? Well, we're just trying to show the effects of of COVID-19, the revenue effects, the expenditure effects, how it's affecting the general fund budget. Okay. Um, I think that was, um, I think that was it. Thank you, Mr. Herring. Sure. I've got a couple of questions too. Um, this is Jacob. Uh, so, um, just for clarification, there's some comments at the beginning and during public comment about one of our past meetings, which was a CRA recently, um, where we were talking about different beautification projects and so on. Um, Mr. Herring, can the police department be funded out of the CRA? No. Okay. Um, and then you talked about penny funds. Um, can you talk about, so wages are not paid by the penny fund, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and then if there's other projects within the CRA, uh, those funds obviously are provided by the CRA. 
um, and not necessarily by the general fund. Um, like the land so purchase I, that was mentioned earlier, that's that's out of the CRA. Right, so you can't use those funds for increased wages or anything like that, right? No, they're restricted for what those purposes like the CRA. Okay, thanks for clarifying that for us. Um, and just, so, I mean, that's one of the things as, um, as I've gotten more experience within the city uh, and I've learned over the years that uh, a lot of times numbers are thrown around on social media or you'll read them in the paper saying, well, why can't we use this funds? These funds for this over here or these funds for that over there, um, that there's certain buckets that we're allowed to use as a city for different types of items. Um, so I, I know it can be confusing at times looking at all the different accounts and the, all the different um, dollars that are posted. Uh, but I just want to make it clear that CRA funds are used within the CRA itself. Uh, penny funds can be used for like, which they are for police vehicles, uh, which I think the city does a great job in refreshing those vehicles as well for the staff. Um, so I just wanted to touch base on that a little bit more. Um, can you go back to um, the union's request for additional funds? So, okay, for, so for clarification, um, I'm looking at the city's already put in the budget $120,000 of pay increase, and that includes benefits. That is correct. So when an individual on staff's increase in pay goes up, that, that means their pension payment goes up as well too, right? Yes, it affects FICA, if their retirement, their pension, and workers' comp. Okay, so it's not just a 3% pay increase, it also increases their, their yeah, pension right. contributions. Okay. Does the police department contribute anything to their pension out of, out of pocket? Yes, the employees do. The employees do? Yes. Do you know what that is? I think it's at the 9.45%. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that for me. Okay. Um, and then the additional 1.8% that's listed there, that's I'm assuming in Ron, if you don't know this, it's fine, but I'm assuming that's the step, average step increase um, that was the city proposed not to have for this year? Well, that's just basically calculated at the additional, taking everybody that's the sworn officers and just taking a time 1.81% with, with the benefits. Okay, got it. All right, thanks, thanks for your presentation. Sure. I did also just have one question for Mr. Herring. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr. Herring, for the presentation. I think it really kind of uh, opened everybody's eyes to the numbers behind this. Uh, I did just have a question. It's on the uh, slide that you're on right now. Couldn't we also take out the SROs, 42 hour work week, the admin sergeants, logistics, all those moving to a 42 hour work week? Did you calculate that when we assumed that it was going to be guaranteed that everybody was going to work a 42 hour week? Because now it seems as though that's going to be at the discretion of the police chief. So I think it's fair to assume that, you know, those numbers might dip down a little bit compared to what's on the slide. Well, those are, you know, calculated based on the 42 hours a week. I guess that's something that's under the bargaining that what we're, I say, what we're proposing, the union's proposing right now. But didn't we just come up with the clarification that that they agreed to that the city and the union just like 30 minutes ago decided hey um it's fine as long as it's at the chief's discretion well then we'd have to find the budget for that because we haven't budgeted for that okay but i guess what i'm asking is just i'm assuming you know that with that's your calculations for a 42 hour work week if that's guaranteed every week of the year correct yes okay and to me it doesn't seem like that's going to be the case if it's up to the chief's discretion. It may be. So basically what I'm just trying to get at is that those two numbers for the SROs 42 hour work week and the community policing 42 hour work week, that's kind of worst case scenario for those two numbers right now. Is that correct? Yeah. And if it's decided that, you know, that's guaranteed and yes, we'd have to find a budget for that. Okay. And then one, one last time, what's the, um, what are the two numbers added together? What we were prepared to give them tonight and what they were asking for? So the, the yellow highlighted number and then the top number? The 120,721 plus 147,722 comes to 268,443. Okay, so roughly 268,000 to meet all the demands tonight? Right. Okay, 
Thank if you. I could, if I could clarify something, I mentioned that the, the, the employee portion was 9.45%. That's the fire employees. The, the police are 8%. I'm sorry, I misspoke there. Okay, I'm good. I have no more questions. Mr. May, may I ask a question, Mr. Eschenfelder? Uh, do any other commissioners have questions before Ms. Jackson moves on? Okay, go ahead, Ms. Jackson. Mr. Herring, has the fire union reached agreement with respect to their contract for the next three years? No. And um, with regard to the 268,443, um, well, I suppose the difference between the two, 147,722, um, what uh, out of what bucket, as you were describing before, there are certain funds that, that are utilized for certain things. Where would that money have to come from? Well, you know, if you if you don't have the revenues, and then if you, you know, if you you know, we've cut expenditures, capital and operating, down to you know, we've got pretty lean expenditures with our departments. You know, so if there's not revenues to increase and no more expenditures to cut, you know, the only other pot would be the unassigned fund balance, which is our emergency reserves for, like I say, if there is a hurricane. And what else is that money used for, that unassigned fund balance? Is it used for first responders in the event of a hurricane? Yes. In what regard? Well, that would be our money in case, you know, hopefully we never get hit with a hurricane, but if we did, we would have to be going into that money. And just so everybody knows, we have a fund balance policy also that with a 20% minimum, 20% of our expenditures of about 25 million. So we have a fund balance million, a fund balance, excuse me, a fund balance minimum of about 5.2 million. Okay, thank you. I have no further questions for you. Thank okay. you, Mr. Herring. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the commission? That's it, thank you. Thank you. Right. I'd now like to ask the city manager if he'd like to make a presentation to the mm -hmm. commission. Yes, I, I, I just need to, to sum things up. I think, I think we've pretty much made our case. This is a simple matter of uh, in this contract year, you, you've heard about the previous contracts where we've, the city has done a great job at trying to keep up um, with the other agencies because we don't want to lose people. Um, we've heard about those good contracts. They've been some big raises in those times. The simple boils down to a case in this uncertain COVID year. And I don't really have to go to these commissioners much in the budget process. The commissioners were through the budget process. Um, they know the tremendous capital cuts was one of the main places we did. We cut a great deal of capital. We cut a lot of things. We're at the point of the budget, again, in the beginning parts of the budget where we had no funds um, budgeted for any city employees. Um, it was uncertain times. It's still uncertain times. Anybody who thinks this is not still uncertain times, um, and of course, I know those from public safety and emergency management knows anything can happen. God forbid we get a second wave of COVID and shuts things down during our tourist and highest part of the season for taxes. Um, you know, we're going to be in a bad strait. We didn't know, and we still don't know, um, mm -hmm. if one of those hurricanes that hit where they hit in poor Louisiana was going to hit. There's just a lot of unknowns. It's a simple case that we asked. We recognize everything the PBA says. Um, we don't have disputes with it. We recognize all that. It's a simple case of asking to deal with those issues when we have some more certainty and hopefully have some funds to deal with. Um, while it was point, it must be remembered while we're talking about this one year thing because of the impasse, we're only talking about one year. We wanted to make sure in year two and three that we had a guarantee. Let's say things go way bad. We put that guarantee in there. Um, again, I, pr I preferred the proposal where they moved in their steps and then had that other amount to kind of equal the 3%, but was done another way. That, I much preferred that to move in the steps, but it came back to me from the union group that from our representatives that they weren't for that report, 
proposal. That's why it went to 3%. So it's a simple case. You see the dollars, you see, you know where the dollars have to come from in this budget. And it simply boils down to a decision of the policymakers, the commission, um, whether to do that now and, uh, or to, again, as, as we did our bargain, you address it in year two and three of the, of the year um, when we hopefully, hopefully have more certainty in our funding and uh, you know, the state of everything. So I think it just boils down to that and that's where the decision boils down with. Really have no arguments with anything said today. Um, we just fix, again, this is not just, I know to the police union, it is, they're concerned about the police union. I have to be concerned about the rest of the city. The commissioners have to be concerned about the city. And we've got another union out there that's sitting here waiting to see what happens here. So those numbers that you see um, that going to be based on your decision, believe me, there's people out there watching and we'll be dealing with it a second time. So there'll be addition to those numbers because we'll be dealing with the other union that's sitting and waiting to see what happens. That's the thing we all have to take into consideration and that this board has to take into consideration and make the decision of which way the cities could go. That's pretty much what I'd like to add in the summation of this matter. Thank you. Jackson, you have anything else? No, thank you so much for your time. Okay, uh, Mayor, before we go to Ms. Lone's uh, questioning, do, uh, we know we've been going a long period of time. Uh, do you wanna poll your commission to see if anybody wants to take a break? Yeah, I'm mute. Mayor, you're on mute. Uh, Mr. Eschenfelder, may I ask a quick question, please? Uh, it's procedural, sure. if you will. Um, I don't know that we can do a screen uh, share uh, without cutting out all the uh, commissioners and everybody, but it would, would it be possible for Mr. Herring to email that one exhibit uh, with regard to the uh, difference in the cost between the, uh, uh, the city's last proposal, the final proposal and, this, and the PBA's last proposal to us so we can have it in hand when we go into executive session? Mr. Herring, are you still on? Can you do that? Yes, I can. I'm, I'm working on emailing it right now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mayor, did you want to see if the commission wants to take a break? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I think we should. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Uh, uh, we're going to have to take a five minutes break. We'll be back. OK, thank you. Thank you.
We are now reconvening the impasse hearing at 9.33 p.m. Mr. Attorney, we ready. Okay, um, we're at a point where Ms. Loan is going to ask for uh, questions of the uh, city's presenters for three minutes. Thank you, sir. I have no questions for the city's presenters. Okay. Then we are <clears throat> at the uh, point of the union's rebuttal, if any. We have a very brief rebuttal, sir. Okay. Detective Lemon, can you unmute yourself, please? Detective Lemon, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, and can you make sure you speak loudly so that we can hear you on the microphone? There's still that distance issue. Yes, ma'am. All right, Detective, are you aware of whether the city elected to give substantial raises to civilian employees even during the COVID-19 environment? I am aware. I'm aware that the commissioners took decisive action in reference to two positions that they deemed not to be paid competitively with surrounding jurisdictions. The next question I have for you, sir, completely different topic, and I'm saying it in a light way, but I mean it with all seriousness. Are homes selling like hotcakes in Tarpon Springs? Yes, they are. Tarpon Springs is obviously somewhere that a lot of people want to, to make their home. And so houses here are definitely selling uh, quickly. And how does the city make money off of that? Well, one of the ways would be property taxes. And so property taxes is something that obviously funds or helps to fund uh, police personnel salaries. And that's something that, that hasn't been impacted or affected by uh, COVID. Totally different topic and subject number three. We heard at the end here, this kind of bomb by the city management that the fire department is waiting on this contract and that the commissioner should all be very, very concerned that if they do something good for the police department here, that the fire department thing is going to blow up. Is that fair? No, not at all. I think I think it's incredibly unfair to try to leverage the police department negotiations with the fire department negotiations, especially when you factor in and consider that the Suncoast PBA first notified the city that we wanted to engage them in negotiation talks at the beginning of this year in January. Uh, the first meeting that we were able to coordinate with the city was in late June or early July. So we would have much rather obviously engage the city in talks while the city commissioners were painstakingly trying to put together a budget, but instead we're left trying to negotiate with the city in late summer when the budget had already been essentially set. Now that's nothing to do with the commissioners. I mean, obviously it's my understanding they didn't even necessarily know that we were engaged in, in negotiations until very late in the process but that isn't something that should be a reflection on the Suncoast PBA because we went, we obviously made a concerted effort to engage the city very early on. So that this could be a collaborative approach, but instead we're left negotiating when a budget had essentially already been set by the city. And so that, that's, like I said, that's, that's something that obviously definitely um, uh, impacts us as far as knowing, knowing what the truth is when it comes to how our negotiations uh uh, occurred. And in the six negotiating sessions that we had with the city that occurred six months after we first requested to begin negotiations. So we requested to begin negotiations in January of 2020. Is that accurate? That is accurate. And the city wouldn't schedule us for a meeting until at the earliest June. Is that accurate? Yes. And during those meetings in June, the first two at minimum, did I present a full and complete proposal to them with documentation in writing? We did. We, we presented very clear uh, objectives in the first two meetings. Uh, we were applauded by the, the other side as far as how clear and the fact that we provided rationales for each thing that we were asking for. Um, and in both those meetings, the city said that, hey, we want to hear what you guys want or what you guys are requesting. We provided that. And then they said, we're not going to give you any sort of feedback in the first two meetings. We want to know exactly what you're asking for. And then it wasn't until meeting number three that we began to get some input back from the city. And during that time, was it clear to you as it was to me that the city was trying to work within a set budget constraint rather than fully fleshing out all of the ideas that both sides might have? 
yeah, it, obviously the, the idea of a negotiation, it's very tough when you know that a budget's already been set with the other party that supposedly is negotiating with you. Uh, as the chief coach indicated, they were operating within very set constraints. Um, but like I said, the idea that that somehow the Suncoast PBA is responsible for the fact that the commissioners now are set with trying to come to terms with a one-year contract when the budget's already been set. That is something that was sadly out of our control. Is there anything that I forgot to ask you that I should? No, you're doing fine. Thanks. I'll take that. <laughs> Nothing further from me, sir. Mr. Mayor, I've completed my rebuttal. Thank hey, you. Mr. Jackson, your rebuttal. Thank you, Mr. Eschenfelder. I have no rebuttal. Okay, then uh, the, it's opportunity for the union to make its closing statement. Thank you. I'd like to be brief. Thank you again for all of your time. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners, you heard a lot of details tonight. You saw a lot of graphs and you saw a lot of graphics and you heard from a lot of people. We're not attacking how the city spends money from various funds and we are not attacking this commission and the way that it spent money in the past. What we said at the opening this evening is the same as now. This decision is straightforward. Do you see the officers on that screen? Are you behind them? Do you see the sacrifice that they make to keep the city safe? Are those men and women worth a 3% general wage increase? Are those detectives worth a 5% specialty pay? You get to make the decision for all of those people. Please keep in your mind as you go into executive session with these now only two remaining issues that these men and women are just asking for their old contract as written beyond those two issues. They're not asking for changes in their step plan. They are not asking for other benefits. And frankly, they deserve so, so much more than we are asking for. Public safety at its core is an economic issue. This stuff costs money. Tarpon Springs is built on safe residences, safe businesses, and safe streets for all of the people who live here and work here and come to visit here. The men and women on that screen, they do that for us. Please invest in them. Please send them home tonight with a contract that we can all be proud of. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lamas Jackson, you're closing. Thank you. Thank you all for your time this evening. And no one questions the value and the dedication of the people on your screen. But the decision tonight goes beyond just those people. What the statute provides is that the legislative body, you all as the Board of Commissioners, shall take such action as it deems to be in the public interest, including the interest of the public employees involved, but not only those employees. It goes beyond that. This is quite simple in that the city is only asking that we give the 3% this year due to the uncertainty that we in the world are presented with, with COVID-19. We have always been open to going back to the table for years two and three, and we will. This is simply a matter of putting some certainty in an uncertain time. We thank you. Hey, Mr. Mayor, now that uh, both sides have completed, uh, it's time for you all to go back into executive session. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the first thing we're gonna have is uh, commission comments and questions. Uh, police work is not an easy work, it's very, very difficult. And we are very proud of our police officers and they're doing a fantastic job protecting our properties the city and the, uh, the residents of Tarpa Springs. But we also were very proud and grateful the firefighters and all the employees of the city of Tarpa Springs. This year, the city of Tarpa Springs was able to provide 3% pay increase to all employees. Also the city for providing health benefits and pensions to all employees. I'm very glad that 
the city was able to provide 3% pay increase to all employees during this coronavirus crisis that we're facing. Uh, I do have some questions that I would like to ask. Um, Mr. Liqueurs, or Mr. Herrick, the general employees, we gave them 3% increase. Is that including the step plan that they have? What you talked about, Mayor, the employees don't have a, the general employees don't have a step plan. They do not? No. Okay. So the only thing they got is a 3%. Yes. Thank you. Uh, just for clarification that a uh, couple of times tonight, I heard about the emergency fund. Uh, the emergency, the purpose of the emergency fund is only for emergency, not for, uh, for pay increases. Uh, also, we heard of the, uh, the fire department contract is in the works as well. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lecourse, do we know what we have budgeted for their increase? The same 3%. So they get, they get the same thing. Well, again, it, it's up to them to know how to distribute that money, but uh, there's 3% uh, budgeted. Okay. The, uh, if the increase is the, um, the city has budgeted $125,000, uh, $120,000, that's the 3%. And in addition to that, the union was requested 147, which is 267,000. If we agree to that, can you tell me what projects we're going to eliminate? That would be up to the commission. You got choice to either eliminate something in the budget or go to reserves. That would be yours as a commission's choice. If we compromise with the uh, with the union, would that would be any idea? Depends what your compromise is. If we compromise fifty percent, that would be seventy three thousand dollars more. I uh, would like to ask Mr. Harry, can we handle that? in our contract, in our budget. That's my, of course, that's my opinion. Of, that's the other commissions that have to uh, yeah. agree with that as well. One Please. of the things, yeah. Mayor, Mayor, you need to understand one of the things is, um, again, there is a misunderstanding of, of number three. Um, although I don't like the fact that you're asking for the chief to decide something, and then obviously in these budget times, he won't decide on um, you got to remember that 22,000 and that 19,000 um, for the 42 hour weeks for the people that's that's up in the air. It seems like they're asking that. I mean, that's not a guarantee that the chief and I don't think the chief would have the budgetary to do that. They're asking for it to be a management right. So um, when these figures were figured up, um, we understood that was a request for them to go to the 42 hour week. So just remember when you're talking to number 147,000, um, the unknown in that is, is you have to subtract out the 22, 247, the 19,464. That's a management right for the chief to do if, if that goes. I know when the chief agreed to it, he said, well, if it's a management right, he doesn't have to do it. I don't particularly like being laid out like that, but it is what it is. Um, that's only if the chief and subsequently the board because um, obviously I wouldn't have them make that decision um, as the board do. So just remember when you talk about the 147, it may not include the 22, 247, and the 19, 464. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Likuris. Now we'd like to go to Vice Mayor Carr. Mayor, uh, thank you very much. Um, Ron, I've got a question for you if you could look this up while um, talking a little bit. Um, code enforcement, revenue, can you look up what the expected um, revenue is for fiscal year 2021, um, if you have that handy? Um, so, code enforcement fine, board fines. We got a budget of ninety nine thousand. Okay, so we're already we collected forty something thousand already this year, right? You're talking the budget for fiscal year 2021. Yes. The budget for 2021 is 99,131. 
but have we didn't we collect forty plus thousand dollars already for that? Are you are you talking about the previous fiscal year? No, I thought. I think you're talking about the settlement attorney. agreement with Bel Air, the settlement agreement from Bel Air Capital that we just yeah. did. Right. Was that fiscal year 2020 or 2021? I'd probably have to look that up to see where that fell in. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, what my point is, is that, I mean, I don't think we should be looking at the uh, um, code enforcement as a revenue generator for the city, but there's still some areas for the city to um, have a, a couple pops for revenue. Um, I heard both sides. And obviously, as you all know, there's multiple funds, there's multiple things in the city that we have to evaluate as city commissioners. Um, we all value everything that you do for the city of Tarpon Springs. Um, and so hearing, hearing more about the step plan, it seems like the step plan is important to the union. Um, so with the, I mean, I would like to make a couple of proposals here and I'd like to see what the rest of the board feels. Um, I mean, I would like to look at what a three and a half percent increase with including the step plan um, would look like. So I think that would address the union's um, want and need to continue the step plan. And then you're also seeing a, a higher increase uh, across all steps as well. Um, so it'd be a total of three and a half percent at each level. And then also from a detective standpoint, uh, I really think that's an important part. Um, the detectives were pretty clear on their, their um, uh, testimony tonight, um, what it's like off hours and the difference it's uh, the difference of their life versus a patrol officer. Um, granted, we didn't hear from a whole lot of patrol officers, but uh, I have talked to some of the detectives in the past and it does sound like there's a lot more um, responsibility in that uh, situation. Um, granted, um, and they also, they also showed us some pretty big discrepancies between other cities. Um, is 5% the, the number we look at this year? I don't know if that's the number. Maybe it's, maybe it's a three or 4% this year. And I would imagine in the next couple of years, you're going to continue to push on that, um, subject from the negotiation standpoint with the union. Um, but the biggest thing is we have to evaluate what funds are available with us today. Um, what projects would be cut, and then also how to balance the budget moving forward with COVID. Um, but with this, I think these proposals of a 3.5% increase that includes a step um, handles a couple of things that you all are asking for from the union side. And then the detective pay, I, I'm in support of that from a vice mayor standpoint. I think it's important to uh, reward our detectives um, is it 5% today? I'm not sure if that's the total number. Maybe it's 4% this year. So I'll maybe propose 4% and then we can look at it for the, um, the next couple of years. So um, with that, I mean, that's all I really have to say right now. Um, I think you all are doing a fantastic job across the board and uh, I really want to be able to show my support. And obviously I'd love to give you all, <laughs> all of our money, but we can't give you all of our money. Um, and uh, that, that's just the, the situation we're in today. So thanks again for your, your uh, continuing um, support and service to the city. Commissioner Donovan. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, first of all, I just wanna thank both sides for their presentations, uh, their witnesses. I think everything really was professional and well handled tonight. Uh, I also wanna thank the rest of the board. This isn't an easy decision and you know I understand where everybody's coming from. Uh, to me, it comes down to dollars and cents, but in, in a different light than kind of what's been portrayed. So the difference between rejecting both of the demands that are established and accepting both of them is only $147,000. And I know it's not fair to you know compare interfund spending and usage, but it's always nice to put things in perspective. And I always go back to the dais that we bought for $76,000. So, I mean, to me, when I first saw that number, I was like, wow, are police worth the price of two desks? Um, <laughs> so that, that, that's kind of a funny way to think about it, but that's just where my mind went. And also, I think, you know, we'd be pretty hypocritical as a board to approve some of the salary increases that we did this year to, um, you know, right wrongs uh, where people were falling behind and then not do the same for our police. So overall, I, I understand voting no on, on things that we don't think are, are worthwhile, um, uh, our, our police are one of our greatest assets, and I'm happy to, uh, to support the two demands.
Thank you. Commissioner Vatikiotis. Um, I, I have one question for Vice Mayor Carr. Uh, the, you said three and a half percent plus the current step plan. No, that would, it would include the step plan. So one of the concerns as a union is that they would skip a, a step plan year. So the three and a half percent would be the step plan and their um, GWI, I think was what was re referred to. So it'd be a total because early in the step plan, it's a higher increase. So it's maybe a 2% later in the step plan. It's like a 1% increase and so on. So it would average out to be three and a half at all levels. Okay, so that's less than what the uh, PBA is asking for. Correct. Okay. Um, let me just say a couple of things. First, um, I, I, um, I think we're looking at about $100,000 um, difference. I, I can tell you that our police overtime could easily go far, far beyond that on any given year. And so I, I really don't think we're uh, talking about a whole lot of money. I'm very disappointed that we're not talking about three years and just one year, I would have liked to have seen a three-year contract. Um, the one thing that I'm, I'm very uh, proud of as far as our police department, especially in this uh, union contract, it gives the um, uh, ratings um, in the back and also um, gives the, um, uh, basically how the uh, ratings are done as far as performance for each police officer where there's different ratings and, and um, if when you have a, a rating of uh, satisfactory but needs improvement, there's a, a remediation plan that's put into effect. So not all the police officers are gonna get this raise as it is, it's just the ones that are, are you know, 1% Tarpon Springs police officers. I don't know what percentage that is, but I'm very happy to see that and that's included in the past uh, uh, PBA contract. So I'm very grateful for that and I'm very proud for that. And I wanna support our police department um, when I first got, um, yeah, it was very interesting when I first got this, um, uh, notice that we're going into, um, uh, this collective bargaining and at the quasi judicial process with the city commission, I thought we we're looking at a lot of money. Uh, so we're not looking at a lot of money at all as compared to what we dealt with in the budget. So, um, I, I don't agree with the uh, mayor's position. I don't agree with vice mayor's position. I agree with uh, Commissioner Donovan that we should uh, give the uh, PBA the uh, 3%. Uh, actually, the, let me just keep it simple. The first two bullets, the general ways increase uh, percentage of uh, 3% with the current step plan and also the uh, assignment of specialty pay regarding personnel assigned to the uh, detective unit effective um, October 1st, 2020. Uh, again, I would have preferred a three-year contract on this. I really don't like one-year contracts. Um, I think um, the, I, I hope that my position doesn't give, send a signal to the police, to the PBA that this is something they should expect next year as, as well. That's why I would have liked a three-year contract. Um, I understand the um, past contract of the front loading from 2017 through 2020. Um, and I think that's consistent with what we're doing right now. Um, uh, that's all I've got to say. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I have a question that I would like to ask uh, Chief Cochin. Chief, can you hear me? Yes, Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, what do we have budgeted for overtime for the uh, police department this year? What is it? Um... You got cut down to 200. I think it's about 500 and something thousand. I think it's what, 475,000. It's usually our overtime budget off the top of my head. Okay. 425,000. How much? Okay. Ron Cuggett. 425. 425. 425. Did we use four, uh, that much overtime last year? Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's down because of COVID, but we use every bit of that money every year. Do you think that we can actually, um, and, and of course the question has been many times, why do we have that much overtime? And you did explain there several times. Uh, the, the difference that we have for the, uh, for the demands of the union, can that be uh, subtracted from the overtime? I don't believe so, Mayor. Um... Uh, we, again, uh, these times are a little different with COVID, but um, our overtime 
in a general sense, we use every penny of that every year. And then, and then you run into the unforeseen. We don't know what could happen. Um, we get a really bad homicide. I mean, I, I don't like messing around with that overtime money. Um, on, on average, we spend every penny of that every year. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chief. That's all I have. Um, do we have any other commission comments or questions? I've just got a couple. Mayor, to follow up on your question with the chief. Um, chief, so a lot of that is for like our events too, right? So, I mean, for overtime wise, I mean, we wouldn't want to, we wouldn't want to reduce our services to our residents. Is that, that's correct, right? Yeah. Um, however, some uh, vice mayor, some of the overtime is reimbursed um, by vendors and some of it we take on. It just depends on the special event. But, but a lot of special events do do eat up overtime. Uh, again, some of them, though, uh, vendors pay a little bit for, but that that's a pretty big line item in our in our overtime budget. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, based on what um, Detective Lemons was talking about earlier, is the special events really gives an opportunity to that I see for our residents to get to know our officers as well. Uh, it's based on what I've witnessed. So um, obviously the city doesn't want to compromise any special event protection or anything along those lines. Um, Mayor, I, I don't I don't know if I understood um, what your what your kind of suggestion was or what your what you wanted to go, which direction or how. Well, that my suggestion was it was to compromise to uh, to compromise if uh, you know the city will come up with a fifty percent. And then the union, the other 50% out of the $73,000, I think is the difference. Uh, Mr. Harry, correct me if I'm wrong, that's $73,000. Is there a difference between us, between the union and the, uh, and the city? The 73,663. Is that the difference? That's the amount of the 1.81% increase over and above the 3%. Okay. And then the detective pay would be $32,348. I just want to be clear. We're not having an open session where the city manager gets to weigh in, correct? Respectfully, sir, I, we've already had everybody here for so long. We're just asking questions. Absolutely, Mr. Mayor. I thought that the question was directed back and forth between you and the vice mayor. So we rely on, we've got to rely on the city manager to provide some information on the background for our funding. So I think that's where that was coming from. Understood. I mean, the difference, the difference in the presentation is 147,000 in, in all. So it's 147,000 roughly, I think it's, you know, like 147, 788 or something, but it's $147,000 and that's meeting all the demands, not just the, you know, 1.8 difference. So, um, I mean, I was on the mayor's, I was kind of going the same way with the mayor's, somewhere, somewhere of a compromise between the two parties. Um, I don't know what was expected on either side. Uh, obviously, we know that the city doesn't want to give more than the 3%, and then this, um, the union wants to get more. Um, I mean, I think a compromise is a fair, a a fair step, um, especially if we don't know where the funds are coming from right now. Um, Mayor, is there a certain way, like where in the compromise would you you be interested in looking at? Is there anything well, specific or do we need to hammer out the detail still or do we need to uh, reconvene or how does that work? What uh, I was talking about is, of course, we know the city already has budget $120,000. The union requests an addition 147,000 and that's what the compromise I was asking. 50% of the $147,000 that comes out to 73,000. I don't know how it's going to go percentage-wise, though. I'm, I'll be honest, Mayor, I, I'm not sure I understand why we're trying to... <laughs> I mean, I, I understand what you're trying to do, but uh, my feeling is we need to keep this simple straight to what the uh, three requests were. And um, if you want to try and negotiate uh, without anybody else being able to speak up, um, I, I'm not sure that that's going to be helpful. My, my feeling is that... Um, Again, um, I, I don't think it's a lot of money that we're talking about. And I, I promise you, by the end of the year, we're going to have a budget um, adjustment 
a resolution that is going to be a lot, lot more than what we're talking about right now. And sure, this may contribute to that, but we're not talking about a lot of money with regard to our police officers, our entire police department, not just a couple of people, but our entire police department, lest anyone above sergeant. Uh, so this is all of our sergeant and patrolmen. So given what we deal with in terms of millions and millions, um, I, I think this 147 or 100,000, whatever you want to talk about, is just not a lot of money. I, I, uh, that, that's the way I see it. Okay. Uh, the floor, uh, Vice Mayor, you were still talking. You got interrupted. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I guess I have a question for our city attorney. Um, I mean, at this point, can we go to the union and ask him if this is something they would be willing or they would be happy with, or it's just ultimately the city's commission's decision to say this is what it's going to be, right? Yeah, I, I think I, I think probably it would be helpful if the commission starts trying to make motions and debating specific motions. Um, I think you all have sort of stated where you sort of are. You can always ask Miss Loan if if the union will agree to something, but it's unlikely that she's going to feel comfortable speaking for the union because she's been in negotiation sessions with her team. And this isn't really a setting anymore where you're negotiating. This under the statute, it's it's time for you all to make a decision on the best interests of both the, the police unions, employees, and, and the whole all city and residents and businesses and, and the whole big picture. As I as I reviewed for you at the beginning of this, so so trying to feel out whether the union likes it, doesn't like it, what they're going to do or feel isn't really going to be very productive. I just think y'all need to, to get to down to making some motions and see if you can get two friends. Okay. Um, so, so it seems like right now we're currently split based on the discussions on the board. Um, there's a couple things I just want to point out real quick too, um, that the police have been targeted across the United States. Um, un, uh, I would say... <laughs> The, there's a target on their back, um, unrightly so. Uh, we've got some bad police officers, just like we have bad doctors, just like we have bad attorneys, just like we have bad um, elected officials, right? Um, that doesn't mean that all officers are bad. And I, I, I've stated multiple times on the board that um, we want to support our police department. We want to support um, and obviously, I mean, if I don't put my vote behind what I've been saying, uh, it's um, hollow words. So, um, I mean, tonight, seeing that, that there's two that are going for the full support of the 147, um, you know, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to push that as well on my side. Um, we need to stand behind our police department. I know that's not going to be the case. Listen, our whole board stands behind the police department, the mayor, the vice mayor, and all the commissioners do. What we're trying to do is really balance our, our budget, balance our funds here on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, there's plenty of unknowns which have been spoke about tonight. Um, the discussions that we're having here are not fun discussions that I get to have in front of everybody. We don't get to have discussions behind closed doors. I don't get to talk to the mayor. I don't get to talk to Commissioner Vatikotis or Commissioner Donovan um, about these things. Uh, this is all done publicly. so. It's the first time we get to talk about these. Um, do I have some concerns about where the money's gonna come from? Um, yeah, do I think we're gonna figure it out? Yeah, we can move stuff around. Um, the city manager has been clear that the budgets are all fluid. Um, so if we need to move some things around this budget season and push it to next budget season, um, we could do that. So um, with that though, I just wanna reiterate that I, I really believe that um, police departments across the United States have really been um, not respected uh, like they should be. And I, I'm, I'm willing to stand up tonight and go ahead and push it further and say we need to go ahead and to compensate. There's extra stress. Um, there's extra fear. I'm sure your spouses and significant others are more in fear now than they ever have been um, as being police officers. And I think this is a good way to go ahead and say thank you for, for what you've done. Um, now, with what Commissioner Vaticota said, um, you do understand that this is an unusual circumstance that you all are coming before the board. Um, I really hope that we could figure this out for the next couple of years for a three year term. Uh, I would prefer not to be in this situation again next year. Um, 
but with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop talking and just say thank you all for your service. Mr. Mayor, if I could uh, make two quick points. Um, as to uh, Vice Mayor Carr's comment about um, not being able to talk to the city manager, it's kind of water under the bridge now, but, but next time you're in this setting, uh, the, the Florida law does allow the city manager to request uh, a closed door non-sunshine meeting with the commissioners to talk about union negotiations. It's, it's the only time in Florida law where you don't even have to have a court reporter involved you just get in a conference room and, and talk with the city manager about where he's going and and, uh, and he can get his ideas from you. So just for the future, I just wanted to correct that for the record. And you know, I know uh, you've mentioned and, and Commissioner Vadikiotis has mentioned a variety of times about wanting a three-year deal. And, and just remind you that under the statute, um, if you make a decision as it appears you're going to um, to go with what the, the two remaining requests that the union ha had asked for. That then gets wrapped into the remainder of the contract that had been negotiated. And I don't think there were any other disputed terms. And that whole package would then go to the union for ratification. And so it could end up being that you will get a three-year contract out of it because there's nothing that the union wasn't asking for. So it's only if the union rejects what happens tonight that it's a one year in position. You understand? Uh, I get it, yes, that makes sense and I'm happy to hear that. Okay, well, just a correction, uh, Mr. Eschenfelter, we received notification and advice not to talk to the, uh, to, uh, to the staff at all. Well, I can only share with you what Florida statutes say. Well, so. that's now how, how did it happen? So understood. Okay. Do we have any other comments? If not, we'd like to go to, uh, to the public comments and then come back to us. I would just have a question of uh, Mr. Eschenfelder. When we make a motion here, are we going to motion for the two proposals that the union put forth since they kind of agreed on the third one midway through tonight's meeting or would we do all three? No, I, I believe that both Ms. Lone and Ms. Jackson are in agreement that so long as the third item is, is a strictly management rights and doesn't impose any requirement on the city, that, that the uh, city, and I think the chief indicated that there was no uh, disagreement on the part of the city's team as to three. So I think three is off the table uh, unless the other side disagrees with that. So you're really only down to the two bullets and, and as uh, whoever makes the motion can either make the motion to approve them both at the same time or break them up into separate motions. It's really up to the motion maker. Thank you. Do we have any other commission comments? If not, we'd like to go to the, uh, uh, to the public comments. Okay, Ms. Manusas, have we received any emails? No further emails were received. Thank you. Mr. Jump, do we have anyone in attendance wishing to speak? If anyone in attendance would like to speak, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. We do have a raised hand, sir. Please put them online. And Mr. Jump, these would only be people who haven't already spoken. Okay, sir. Then Ms. Kladak, I do believe you've already spoken at this point. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Please raise your hand. If you could please state your name and address for the record. Hi, my name is Alyssa Spatz. And um, for the purpose of this call, I'm going to have my address reflect 444 South Huey Avenue. Thank you. I would just like to thank all the commissioners for um, participating tonight on behalf of the families. Thank you. 
If anyone else would like to speak, please raise your hand. And we have no other raised hands at this time, sir. Thank you, it's back to us. But before I entertain a motion, I'd like to comment and to thank uh, the representatives of the uh, uh, PBA and the city for presenting this uh, item before us. I think they did a terrific job and uh, we appreciate that also. I'd like to express my uh, support and my gratitude to our police officers. I think they're doing a fantastic job, as I said earlier, of protecting our properties and the people of Tarpa Springs. Uh, with that, I, um, and also I'm going to support to uh, uh, the, the request of the uh, police department as well. So with that, I, uh, I will entertain a motion. Make a motion to approve. to approve the uh, PBA, uh, offer the PBA the following uh, contract uh, terms uh, to increase the general wage uh, to 3% and also maintain the current step plan. And secondly, to um, uh, add a 5% base hourly rate increase to personnel assigned to the detective unit. I believe that sufficiently covers it. Uh, uh, do you want to comment that the third bullet has been uh, dissolved? I can add that just to make sure that um, that the um, that we move the uh, resource officer, logistics officers, community police officers, and administrative sergeants uh, to a 44, 42 hour work week at the discretion of the police chief. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Ms. Van Nuys, roll call, please. Commissioner Batagiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor El Huzas? Thank you. And that concludes the special session in, um, in PACE solution hearing, and it's adjourned at 10.15 p.m. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you all.